What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If A Martial Arts Master Transmigrated Into Tai Lung? Part 3. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Tai Lung's POV who would have thought that Lord Shen and his minions would be camping out in such an obvious location, and that too so close to the city. Interesting. I said and looked around at the cultivated farmland that spread out as far as the eye could see. They were growing rice, pulses, potatoes, beans etc. and right at the center of the fields were huge buildings ranging from storage, houses and greenhouses. But the gorilla and wolf guards patrolling the surroundings told me that these buildings were not used as they were supposed to be. Something bigger and more serious than simple grains and farm tools were housed inside these buildings. I took in the scent of gunpowder and iron coming from the buildings, and I could already guess what was inside. But how can Shen get himself such a great and obvious hideout? I ask myself. The whole thing was too convenient. The fact that it was near the main road so that cannons could be easily transported. The way it was on a farm where the soldiers could get sufficient rations. The location which was close to the city but at the same time very well hidden from everyone else. It was too good to be true. The whole thing told me that there was a deeper plot to it. I could stand here and think about it, or I could go attack the guards and ask them directly. After a few seconds of contemplation, the choice became obvious. Violence it is. I said with an evil smile before I approached the place guarded by patrolling wolves and gorillas. I quickly walked through the dirt road leading to the center, and it did not take long for the guards to notice me. Hey, you did you not see the sign get out of here? A giant gorilla came up to me with two other wolf soldiers. I did indeed see the sign that says it was the private property of Zhang Wai, the patriarch of the Wai noble house. But I was pretty sure Lord Shen and his goons were not of the Wai house. Are you deaf beggar? I said leave. The gorilla seemed to have a short temper as he came up to me quickly. I swiftly took down my hood and he stopped on his track. Are you sure you want to do this monkey? I asked and all three of them were rooted on the spot. I smiled in satisfaction. The only time I liked being feared. Like everything in life, being feared has its good and bad sides. Not long after, one of the wolves turned around and sprinted towards the building, possibly to inform the others of my presence. I did not say anything and let the wolf run away from me. Then I continued walking towards the building, and even when I walked past the two remaining guards, they did not do anything. But when I walked past them and my back was turned against them, they thought they could launch a surprise attack at me. Higher, the wolf soldier swiped his sword at me from behind. Idiot, screaming out loud, destroys the whole purpose of a surprise attack. But I could understand, it must have taken a lot of courage to even attack me from behind. He could not be blamed for screaming out to calm his nerves and to push down his fears. I quickly turned around and chomped down on the incoming swords that was aiming for the back of my neck. My canines clamped down on the steel and easily broke it into pieces. Then in one effortless motion, I kicked his knee and it immediately overextended and bent the wrong way. When you are afraid and put everything behind an attack, your muscles tensed up and you become unaware of where you even put your body weight. This time, the wolf put all of his weight on one leg to spin and swing as hard as he could. A big mistake as a small pressure caused him to break his limb. Crack! He let out a shrill of pain like a kick puppy, before he quickly fell on the ground. His gorilla friend swung his giant arms at me in a hulk. Gorillas were born with powerful torsos, and their arms were one of the strongest pairs in all of the animal kingdom. So a casual swing of the gorilla held enough strength to make a whistling sound as it whipped towards me. It was nothing compared to the likes of Master Rhino though. I weaved past the hook and delivered an uppercut to his chin that shook his brain, and immediately made his body limp. I did not stop there as I hugged his huge arms and tugged as hard as I could. I smiled madly before I pivoted on my heels and spun around. The gorilla's huge body obeyed my action, and I spun around six times, gathering momentum before I let go and threw him towards the building. His huge body flew in the air, sailing across more than 50 meters on the sky before he crashed into the building like an asteroid, and a huge explosion followed. Buong when you think about it. It's quite tragic that Shen was about to face me instead of the inexperienced Po as he was supposed to. But I guess he was going to lose either way so it didn't really matter. Let's see who is the better villain. I said with an amused smile before I cracked my neck. 
Then with a roar, I tore off my cloak and sprint towards the destroyed building on all fours. The guards inside immediately got alerted, and when they saw me running towards them, they visibly shook in their place before they got courage in their numbers. An attacker protect the base, one of the wolves said and they all started charging at me. My eyes flashed and I counted 67 of them. It was said that the strength of the wolf was the pack, so they were braver and far more stronger when they attacked me together. They were nothing but pests to me though, as I easily took them out when they were close to me. It was almost like they were running to their own death as they approached me with an adrenaline-filled body. I never stopped running as I easily cleared them out. Their bodies flew and crashed against each other, and one hit from me was enough to put them out. I dodged two arrows shot my way, and I ran in a zigzag to avoid more shots. Three wolves swung their sword from different directions, and I quickly spun around and swept them off their feet. Then before they hit the ground, I hit their nerves and they fell paralyzed on the ground. I continued my approach. I was an unstoppable force which the wolves could never hope to slow down even for a second. Finally, when their numbers were dwindled, I grabbed one by the throat and lifted him off the ground. The house they were hiding in was only a few meters in front of me. How long have you been staying here? I asked and waited for two seconds. But the wolf was only struggling and growling. He was not interested in answering my question. So I slammed him on the ground while ducking under a sword that was aiming to chop off my head. Then I caught the attacker by the throat and did the same as I did before and lift him off the ground. Is the house of Y supporting you or are you blackmailing him? I asked and the wolf answered this time. He 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 is on Lord Shen's side he gave us dash. The wolf died in my hand before he could finish as a blade shaped like a feather lodged itself at the back of his skull. My ears picked up the sound of feathers fluttering in the wind, and my nose finally caught the scent it was always tracking. I threw the corpse of the wolf to the side, and locked eyes with the white peacock, that had finally come out to confront me. Tai Lung. Sheng greeted me as he landed elegantly on the ground. His eyes held the seed of insanity, but the spark of cunning and intelligence in them was what caught my attention. Shen, I said and his eyes scrunched up at my casual way of addressing him. He was used to being called Lord Shen or Prince Shen all his life. I think I was the only one who used to, and still called him Shen. To what do I owe the pleasure of your visit? He asked me in a measured tone. A normal person might not notice it, but I instantly picked up his long words and slow speaking. He was buying time. I looked behind him, and I could see the gorillas slowly bringing out the cannons and they adjusted it to point at me through the wall of the house. So that's why only the wolves came to intercept me. If he wanted to buy time, I could let him. Oh, I thought I'd visit before leaving the city. You seemed to be in a hurry the last time we met, so we did not have a proper reunion. I said with a smile on my face as I confidently folded my arms. Tell me. Do you still cry when the maids forget to put warm water in your bathtub? I asked and I saw his eyes twitch. We were old acquaintances who knew each other even during our childhood, so I was aware of these things. He acted more flabbergasted and upset than he actually was to buy time. He was a great actor as I saw him choke on my words, and his eyes turned angry. Are you insolent cat? Do you want me to tell this to Shifu? You will cry again if Daddy Dearest scolds you. He snapped back at me and I choked on my own breath. I coughed a couple of times to shrug off my embarrassment before I said, I did not cry. I was just teary. Sure you were. He draws and turned back to look at his cannons. When he saw that his weapons were ready, a crazy smile appeared on his face. But this would make daddy cry for sure he said and leapt back. His wings spread out as he floated backwards, and he landed on one of his cannons. The gorillas pushed the cannons and they destroyed the wall. Finally, six dragon-shaped cannons appeared and aimed towards me. I stayed in my place and my arms remained folded. A confident smile that borderline sadistic was on my face. Hair fire tie lungs POV fire b tomb b tomb. Six dragon-shaped cannons exploded consecutively, spewing fire, followed by searing orbs made out of metal. The cannonballs flew at me, slicing through the air and leaving a wave of heat and shock within their path. Not a single thing was spared and they shot out so violently that everything which came in contact with them was destroyed. I entered in a piece and the destruction shaped spheres slowed down to a crawl from my perspective. If a newly awakened Poe with inner peace could deal with this, I was overqualified for it. I unfolded my arms and relaxed my muscles to imitate waves as I got ready to face the cannons. Multiple balls of metal shot toward me and without and once of fear, I reached out my hand to intercept the first one. An action of a madman, my kai became water that flows along my body and my muscles also relaxed to become flexible like liquid, so that when the ball reached my hand, I was able to control the trajectory and force behind it. The ball of metal that shot toward me at the speed of 300 plus miles per hour, became a normal sphere in my hands, as I spun around to control it. My hands shone with brilliance, 
And I left a trail of white light when I moved my hands. Water stream rock smashing fist. It was not a unique concept to me. To use the power of your opponent and to fight force with finesse instead of fighting force with force. To flow like water to be extremely adaptable but to also have the capacity to crash. It was a concept I was more than familiar with, so it was not hard for me to recreate. I spun around and threw the cannonball back at the cannon which shot it. An explosion destroyed the weapon of fire and steel. I did the same thing to the four other cannons with their own ammunition that followed. I moved with the elegance of water, but when necessary, I crashed like a waterfall. My hands became a blur of white as each stroke of my arms redirected and controlled the violent force behind the cannonballs. The gorillas that handled the weapons were knocked out due to the forceful shockwaves, as their own weapon had turned against them. I used a different approach for the last shot though as I twirled my hand around the flying metal. Then I used my hand to redirect all of its force into its rotation, Shaolin soccer style. I put the ball on top of one of my fingers, and let it spin there like a basketball. I looked at my work with a smile before I turned my eyes towards Shen. His eyes were wide and in absolute disbelief. The weapons which he had created to destroy Kung Fu was easily dealt with by Kung Fu. I scoffed and continued making the cannonball spin on my finger. Was that really it? Do you think that would be enough to stop me? That's impossible. Shen muttered in disbelief. I tossed the spinning cannonball in the air and caught it with the finger on my other hand. I slapped it to make the ball spin faster. Yeah, but remarkable people like me can achieve the impossible. I said with a smile. Although if we can do it, it shouldn't really be called impossible. It's impossible to do the impossible. Huh, shower thoughts. Shen was rooted in his place for a long time before he gritted his beak and turned around to leave. He abandoned everything since he knew survival was his main goal now. Oh no you don't. I thought to myself before taking a step forward, and I planted my feet on the ground, causing cracks to form. There was this one sport in my past life where it was basically just throwing a ball at each other and batting. It was just a sport. But many generations of athletes had dedicated their lives to refining the act of throwing a ball, until the technique became unrivaled. Kung Fu was not only limited to combat or martial arts. A true Kung Fu master knows that everything is Kung Fu. I used my knowledge of that sport to execute the perfect throw, as the cannon exploded out, and broke the sound barrier before it returned right where it came from. The action caused a huge explosion as a consequence, and the cannon exploded. The fire and heat soon caused the other gunpowder in the house to catch on fire as another wave of explosion erupted. A shockwave strong enough that it could uproot trees descended on the earth, and I crouched down to not be blown away. The giant explosion swallowed everything in its vicinity, and the earth experienced its first man-made calamity. The explosion of a bomb. Booyom I slowly rose amongst the smoke and dust caused by the explosion. The searing air of the aftermath hit my fur, and the charred earth burned my fort. The thick smoke blocked my view. So I spun around and used the crane-style kung fu to disperse the smoke. I whipped my arms like wings and with a roar, a shockwave erupted from me and cleared all the smoke and derbies. My ears were constantly ringing due to the loud explosion, and I felt disoriented. Maybe it was not such a good idea to do that after all. I looked around and the bodies of the wolf soldiers and gorillas greeted me. I rubbed my eyes, and I quickly scanned the surroundings in search of Shen, but I did not see a single white feather. My nose twitched as I tried to find Shen's scent, but I was unable to. Even using inner peace did not help as the smell of burnt objects and gunpowder numb my sense of smell. It would require more than a small miracle to be able to track Shen right now. I let out a sigh and kicked a pebble. Did I just let him get away while trying to stop him? Maybe I should have just thrown the cannonball at him. But Shen was a master of Hing Kung, a style that can make him weightless and allow him to fly. The same Kung Fu Shifu specialized in, and I was afraid he would use the momentum of the cannon to simple fly away with his weightlessness. No use crying over spilt milk, I said to myself. It's not like it would be useful to track him again after this. Technically, Shen was not a criminal, as his punishment for massacring the panda village was being banished. So if I did not catch him red-handed like I had the chance to do just now, it would be a useless endeavor to go after him. Imagine being merely banished for committing a village-sized genocide. But I was left to be imprisoned for life in a cave alone and paralyzed for a much weaker case. Must be nice to be a prince and to be so harmless. Just kidding. I was kind of proud that even Uwe himself saw me as such a threat that I needed to be put away for life. If it was 10 years or a small punishment, I would have definitely come back for vengeance, and I would be too powerful to be stopped. The plan to get a good reputation by saving the city proves to be unsuccessful. I said to myself in a sad tone before my voice quickly gained back its vigor, moving on, 
I walked back to the path that I came from and picked up my bag before flinging it on my shoulder. Then I continued my journey. But a question popped into my mind. Where should I go? I could go south from here and head towards Dali in the Yunnan province, which was said to be the current home of Master Tiger, another old foe by the way. Or I could continue west and head to the Nanzhao Kingdom, where a new master had risen while I was in prison. He was in the same generation as Wu Bao, and he called himself Mighty Eagle rather than a master. I hope he is not the mighty eagle that comes to mind I thought to myself. That would be rather disappointing. In one of the scrolls written by Ugwe near the end of Ugwe's life, mighty eagle and his newfound kung fu style were mentioned. Ugwe describes him as a giant eagle with a heart for justice, and a deep obsession with freedom. That is not the important part though as Ugwe stated that he was one of the most powerful masters he had ever seen. Mighty Eagle had the strength to cut down mountains with a flap of his wings. It would definitely be interesting to meet the youngster. In the end, I could not decide which one I should go to. So I picked up a stick from the road and let it balance with my finger. Then I let it go and the stick fell down. The place where he pointed was where I would be going. Hum. I hummed when I saw the direction the stick was pointing. It was neither south nor west but the east. What is in the east? I said to myself and pondered for a while before a certain chameleon popped into my mind. Juniper City was on the east coast of China. I could go there and visit Juniper City as I have never been there before. That was a place for criminals, and since no worthy foes were there, I was never interested in that place. I have no desire to fight the chameleon either because I did not consider her a real kung fu master. She was a thief and cheat copycat, but it would be nice to beat her up. It could be a way to reclaim my honor for what happened to me in the fourth movie, which by the way, did not exist according to many fans including myself in my past life. So east it is. I said with a smile and was about to head east. But before I could even prepare, I felt a sudden shift of air from behind. My ears were still ringing, and my other sense had been messed up by the explosion, so someone managed to nearly sneak up from behind. Fortunately, after mastering inner peace and becoming one with the world so frequently, I could sense the world around me in more ways than just the physical senses. I immediately entered inner peace and I did not even have to let my Kai out, as the miracle I needed was within my own body. I did the opposite of when I used water stream rock smashing fist, and I let my muscles tense up to the limit. I stopped my blood flow and heartbeat as my muscles bulged out and became solid in my body. Tekai the super defense. Clang. The sound of steel hitting steel resounded through the place as my body shot forward like a ragdoll. I managed to avoid any damage but the force behind whatever hit me was enough to send me flying for nearly a hundred meters. I spread out my arm and flipped in the air to stop my momentum before I landed on the ground. Then I turned back, my yellow eyes skipped the distance and locked onto the one who dared sneak up on me. A deep growl that shook the surrounding air rolled off my throat. The vibration sent a heavy threat in the air like waves. Master Rhino, Tai Lung's POV I have lived two lives, and I was already more than 40 years old in just one of my lives. So you could imagine the amounts of idiots and stupid people I have come across. Yet I have never seen such an idiot like the Rhino in front of me. Who the fuck comes out of the hospital bed to attack the same person who put them on said hospital bed? That too only after two days. Master Rhino, I said, my voice barely held together by a single string of calm and understanding. To be attacked on the back by someone I respected and acknowledged was something I would normally never tolerate. But since the guy was full of badges and wore a gown that showed he ran here from bed without even preparing for a fight, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. He had no chance of defeating me, even though that was also true if he was in perfect condition. So I could understand why he wanted to take every advantage he could get, no matter how cowardly. Was the beating I gave you two days ago not enough? What is the meaning of this? I asked him in a deep threatening voice. The last part came out more like a growl than words. I should be asking you that quote rhinos yelled out, loud and angry. What is the meaning of this? I thought you came in peace and only wanted a duel. I might not be able to fight right now, but I will not take this kind of disrespect lying down, Tai Lung Master Rhino said, and blew out steam from his nose. His eyes were red with unattended anger, to have my subjects come crying helpless, attacked by the same person I told them was not a mindless evil villain, to have the person I allowed into my city and welcomed as a guest backstab me while I am unable to protect my people. He roared in rage. I gripped my teeth and reeled in my anger so that I could think things through calmly. Two fires will never make anything but destruction, so I had to be the calm one here. The place Lord Shen used as his hideout was the farm of a noble housewife of Gongmen City. The wolf I asked about could not finish answering me, but from what I heard, it seemed the Y noble house was supporting Shen. That means technically, 
I was attacking the land of the Y clan. I was attacking his subjects like he said. I was in the wrong. Damn it, they set me up. Or should I say I set myself up? And the Y family will probably never admit that they were helping Shen, the banished prince. They must have alerted Master Rhino the moment I attacked and told him that I was destroying their land. You have crossed the line. Tai Lung, your own strength has deluded you and stripped you of all your dignity. Master Rhino spat out angrily. You betrayed me. Master Ugwe was right about you. There were a few things that can anger me at this point in my life. I have achieved inner peace and I have accepted myself as I am. But that did not mean I was immune to anger and frustration. The truth is, I have emotions and feelings too. What was it that he said? I betrayed him. What fucking line did I cross? I yelled back at him, bearing my fangs. Who the hell does he think he is? Allow me in his city. Welcome me as a guest. Did he really think he was doing a good thing and being generous when he did these things? Does he really feel betrayed that after showing me all this goodwill? I attacked his lands. The audacity. What goodwill? He acts like he had a choice, you weakling. I called him out just as he was. How could he act like he was doing good and being kind when he was so weak? The truth is, to be good and kind requires strength. If I went to his city and he decided that he did not want to allow me in his city, can he really stop me? If he did not welcome me as a guest and ask me to leave, can he bear my anger and make me leave? He can't. Because he is weak and I am strong. So he did not have a choice in the matter. He allowed me into his city. And he welcomed me as a guest because he had no choice. Not because he was good or being kind. He was just weak. If he was stronger than me. If he could stop me from entering his city. And if he could bear my anger and force me to leave easily without any real loss on his part. Then that will be goodwill. That will be being kind. The weak cannot be kind to the strong. It takes strength to be good. I did not cross any line. And I did not get any goodwill from you, Rhino. Because you are weak, don't think being weak is the same as being good. I said. And what was this about being welcomed into the city and being allowed? Even if he truly did it out of his own free will, his words were just words. How the citizen treats me and how they act towards me could not have been further from his claims. I could literally feel how I was unwanted and how I was rejected while I stayed there. He told his subjects to knit worry about me and that I was not an evil villain. How nice of him, but it was pointless. His words were nothing but hot air and vibration. And to come here, speaking all of this crap to me, and even dare to say Ugwe was right about me. I'll show him I made a promise in my heart. Now one might wonder, if he was weak and he had no choice but to welcome me into the city, how did he dare to come at me now? Isn't he weak? Shouldn't he be acting kind and forgive me if you are so strong? The answer lies in the people that were already surrounding me. My senses were dulled at the moment, but I could still feel them. They stuck out like a sore thumb. Their intention was clear. They wanted to take me down. Then they finally revealed themselves. Master Ox, Master Croc, Master Elephant, Master Gazelle, and there were two new members too. The reason why he dared came to me now was because his subordinates from the Kung Fu Council had finally came to the city. When he thought he had enough people to take me down, that's when his kindness and goodwill ended. I hate the weak. The two new members were Master Lizard and the so-called Monkey King, Master Sage. You think you all can take me down? I yelled and looked at each and every one of them in the eyes. Don't you want to check the ruin first? See if there are remains of a weapon, or if the unconscious soldiers were working under someone else. Do you not want to hear my explanation first? I ask them. You can explain yourself in the Supreme Court of Gong Men City. Monkey King, the Sage of the West said to me. He was probably the strongest enemy right now. I know him. I have fought him and defeated him in the past before. But he was younger than anyone else I fought against and had great potential. It seemed he was in his prime right now and full of strength. So be it. I said and lowered my body in a stance. I entered in a peace as I felt my mind calm down, and my anger receded. I finally had a clear mind again, sharper than ever before, and it was ready to fight. My emotions were controlled now, but my intent was still strong. So I let my intent flow out as my will be pressed down on everyone surrounding me. It was not conqueror's haki, but it was close. Their body tensed up and I started growling at them. My deep voice reverberated out in a threatening vibration that strike fear to those who hear it. They feel it. They were weak and I was strong. None of them were predators. They were all prey. Come. I declared like the superior I was. To call someone to attack was done by teachers to their students or seniors to their juniors. It means that since they were so much stronger, they allowed the weaker to attack first. I did the same. Arrogant like always. Monkey King said, and they all charged at me. Tai Lung's POV Monkey King was known as the Sage of the West. Because at one point during my time in prison, there was a war in the West, and the Monkey King was an active player. 
He made a name for himself as a ruthless and bloodthirsty demon of a warrior. But that was until he got enlightenment. He attained inner peace and tranquility. And after that, he single-handled ended the war in the West Province. After he attained inner peace, he sought out harmony and peace instead of chaos and war. He earned the title Sage of the West due to his endeavor. But that warrior known to pursue peace more than anything else leapt at me. He flipped in the sky and descended towards me like a shooting star. That was not just words either. He was literally glowing yellow and his body cut straight towards me. In a piece, the ability to create miracles and achieve the impossible. He had it too. He was one of the few who had attained in a piece, and by far the youngest master to achieve it. His body was bathed in yellow energy as he was past me. I twisted my body in an incredible show of acrobatics, and dodge his kick. Boom his kick was strong enough that it caused an explosion when it hit the ground. It seems he had mastered a way to enhance his whole body using his kai through in a piece. He was enhanced to an impossible level. That was his miracle. What a waste. I thought to myself when I saw the straightforward use of inner peace. It just goes to show how an ability could be so different in power depending on the user. Let's show him how to truly utilize the ability of inner peace. I crouched down and focused my mind on my next action as all of the other masters had finally reached me. They attacked me from different angles and directions, all at the same time to make sure I was defeated. They did not have the luxury of holding back against me. I continued crouching down, and my eyes remained shut until the very last moment. When I opened my eyes they were glowing bright yellow, and the world stilled. The concept behind Shunpo was getting from point A to point B in the least amount of steps. I have mastered this technique and the concept behind it to such a degree that I could use it in my attacks. Hitting targets A and B in the quickest and shortest way possible. My Kai reacted to the miracles I desired and I felt a huge chunk of my Kai being used for the impossible feat. Due to my huge reserves, I never noticed my Kai draining, but this time I could feel a dent in there. I was pushing the limit of a small miracle. My body became a flash as I kicked Master Croc and Master Lizard under their jaws. I was too quick that the world hadn't even realized it yet. Then I moved like a flash towards the others who had attacked me. I gave an uppercut to Master Ox, and I hit Master Elephant right in the abdomen as hard as I could with my infused Kai and my attacks. After that, I went back to my place and crouched back down. There were five phantoms of my image attacking them all at the same time as time resumed. The world finally caught up to my actions, and reality shook in confusion. It shows six images of me. Whoosh. EOW. X44 attacks, but it sounded like one. I seemingly remained in place as they were all thrown back due to my attack. A small and satisfied smile tugged my lips when I locked eyes with the Monkey King. This was how to do it. This is what achieving the impossible looks like. My eyes caught a gasp coming from the side, and I saw Gazelle looking at the display with a shocked face. She was the only one wise enough to not attack me, as she had the ability to tell how strong someone was. Other than me, she was the only one who knew they did not stand a chance. Smart girl. I turned my focus back on the Monkey King, but he was gone. I used my senses to figure out where he went, and my ears picked up a disturbance in the wind. Above, I looked up to see Monkey King flying down at me. His whole body had dimmed down a bit, but the palm of his hand was glowing brightly even in the morning sun. Arrogant cat take this. He screamed and pushed his palm toward me. My instinct screamed at me so I used flash steps to move away immediately. Right after that, a heavy force pushed down on the place I stood before, leaving a gigantic hand mark 20 feet long and 10 feet wide. Shuruobuom. The earth was left to be forever traumatized. It was forced to bear the consequences of the monkey who missed. I did not see the attack. But I knew exactly when and where it was coming. I stood at the very edge of the handprint as the force belly caught my fur. He landed on the ground with a frustrated face, as his surprise attack did not do anything. I tilted my head at him, arrogant. I asked in using Shunpo, I was behind him in one single stride. Did you forget who I am? I asked and he turned around and threw a hook which I easily caught with my hand. His Kai which was covering his body fought against mine but my Kai proved to be heavier and stronger. So he is using the Kai covering his body as an armor too. Then he focused his Kai on his palm before throwing out that devastating attack. I analyzed it quickly. The way he used his Kai reminded me of the way hunters used Nen from Hunter x Hunter. I watched in rapt attention as his Kai flowed around his body and focused on the arm I just caught in one of his legs. His Kai was glowing, so it was visible to everyone how his arm and leg became brighter, while the rest didn't. I could tell what he was trying to do. He planted his shining leg on the ground, and then he flung me off my feet. His strength was surprising for his build as I was thrown away like a pillow. It was truly interesting. I have been so focused on what I could achieve with my Kai, 
that I forgot to take into account what my kai can do by itself. I should really look into it afterwards. I planted my feet on the ground, and I also used my claws to slide to a stop. Then the five masters were on me again. Master Ox charged at me like the bull he was, and Master Lizard possessed wings on his feet as he moved around in a blur. My main disadvantage here was their number, so I figured I should reduce that number quickly. I dodged a kick from Master Lizard, and we exchanged fast speed attacks for a few seconds. Our attacks became a competition of speed as our arms seemed to multiply to 12. I growled and put more strength behind my attacks, but before I could overwhelm him, I had to leap back and dodge Master Ox's charge. The ground shook with every step he took, and he quickly turned around and came at me again. I dodged a flying sword thrown by my Master Croc while exchanging attacks with Master Lizard before everyone retreated from me. A shadow loomed over Mr. and I looked up just in time to see the gigantic body of Master Elephant falling down on me. His sheer weight and size made it seem like he was coming at me slowly, but he covered the distance rather quickly. They should have learned by now that I was too fast to be caught by something like this, but they tried it again anyway. I moved away from my place as Master Elephant crashed in my previous position. Thardum, a defeating explosion materialized, and it was followed by a quake of the earth. I was thrown off my feet due to the tremor and the intense shockwave that followed forced me to protect my face from flying sticks and pebbles. It was a way to get my feet off the ground, similar to what Master Rhino did in a fight. Master Oxes immediately slammed on my body before my feet could touch the ground. Like Master Like Student, Master Rhino must be proud. I roared at Master Ox as he continued slamming his head against my body, taking me somewhere far away. He spun his whole body and my arm got stuck between his long horns as it got twisted along with his body. He was going to break my arm. Not today. I said and my arm started glowing white. My fur stood up as if caught on electricity, and I pumped a shit ton of Kai on my arm for enhancement. An enhancement beyond normal. It was something I copied from Monkey King moments ago. I whipped my arm, and my newfound strength was even more impressive than I thought as I broke Master Ox's horn instantly. Crack. Yah, he screamed in pain and I couldn't help but smile a huge smile. I caught the broken horn which was a couple of feet long and curved, before I stabbed his back. He let out a pained roar before he stopped moving and feel down limply as he should. I stabbed him right at his nerve point, so he was out for good. The fight almost reminded me of my sparring with the Furious Five, but the only difference was that these people did not know how to work as a team like my students. Master Lizard with his speed was the first to reach me again. His body was flexible and fast, so it was difficult to attack his nerves. He threw a punch towards me, expecting a similar exchange as before, but this time I used my claw and swiped at his body. Four cuts appeared on his torso, and blood spilled out instantly. I could turn him into mincemeat, but I didn't. He stayed suspended in shock, and I used that time to hit two of his nerve points. That was two down, three more to get. Tai Lung Monkey King yelled at me, don't kill them. Let's talk things out. I dropped Master Lizard's body to the side, and I stepped on Master Ox's head while I looked at the remaining three in amusement. Master Elephant was not suited for a fast-paced battle or teamwork fight. He was stronger individually or in a war. Master Croc was known for his impenetrable scales, so his style of kung fu relied mostly on tanking his opponent's attack and counter-attacking. When left to fight someone of my caliber as a team, he did not know what to do the only remaining threat was Monkey King, but he knew he couldn't win. I could tell from his eyes that he was shocked to see me using his technique just now too. They can't win and they realize that now, which was why they wanted to talk instead of fighting. When they were not sure of winning, they instantly cowered again. But this time, I did not want to talk. You can talk in the spirit realm, I said and returned his words before I blurred towards them. I left several after images and threw a punch which Monkey King was barely able to dodge. He gritted his teeth under the weight of my strength, and his feet got planted on a broken ground. Their once confident face was now washed with despair. Tai Lung's POV although I said I could copy his technique, it was not quite the same. It was a cheap imitation I did by letting out my Kai around the body parts I wanted to be enhanced. On the other hand, Monkey King seemed to be able to control his Kai, even when it was outside his body. Which I could also do but barely as my Kai did not obey me when they were outside my body. I can control my Kai however I wanted if it was inside my body. But after leaving my body, I could barely give directions to them. The most I could do was not let them leak out and control how they snuggled up to my body. But Monkey King was able to control it as simply as controlling one of his limbs. It was baffling to me how he was able to do it so easily. With his mastery, he was basically a pseudo-master of Kai. I should definitely look into it in the future. 
But for now, I continued pushing my leg down on the Monkey King, as he used both of his forearms to block my hammer kick. The earth beneath his feet slowly creaked under the weight of my strength as his forearms glowed brighter and brighter. He let out a scream as he resisted my power. The fur on my legs was also glowing ominously. I may not be able to let my kai flow from one part of my body to the other, but I could simply conjure it in the place I wanted enhancement. The ground continued cracking like glass before it finally gave out. It yielded under the weight of my raw strength, and Kai as the ground sank down. Boom! Heh! I smirked and I continued adding more pressure. The Monkey King was the same height as me, but right now he was on his knee, and barely resisting to not get crushed. Then I finally released a lock and I spun around. As I said before, I could not move my Kai from one place to another, but there were many ways to overcome that weakness. I planted my enhanced feet on the ground and generated my power from there. The ground opened up under me as my body carried the force until it came to my other leg. Then I kicked the Monkey King on his chest with my unenhanced leg. But with my technique, it held the same strength as the enhanced one. His ribs caved in, and his eyes nearly popped out of his socket. The force behind my kick sent him flying, his body skipped on the solid ground like a rock skipping on water. He disappeared out of sight and out of the fight. A shadow loomed over me, and I dodged the slow-moving fist of Master Elephant as he destroyed the ground. I spun three times in the air, gathering insane amounts of momentum, before I kicked his face with my enhanced leg. My kick sent one of his tusks flying away as I broke it like a toothpick. His body went limp and he fell face first on the ground. I was so much faster than him yet at the same time. I could deliver more powerful blows than him. He never stood a chance. Thup, so it's only you guys left. I asked while turning towards the last remaining people. Master Rhino was way over at the back barely visible from view at this point as there was a lot of throwing each other around during the fight. Gazelle the cunning girl was by the side, quickly making sure the people I defeated were not dead and giving them first aid. Then there was Master Croc who was clueless on what to do next. You're quite incompetent are you? I asked in amusement and the croc gulped. I blurred from my position and came in front of him. He reacted immediately and he spun around, showing me his back and his impressive scales, which were said to be impenetrable. Thunderclap. I said and reality became distorted when my fist met his back. A crack of lighting erupted from my fist when I hit him, and his scales were not able to take it. I broke through the so-called impenetrable scales, and I left a bloody fist mark on his back. He arched while letting out a silent scream before he fell face first on the ground. I did not stop there as I disappeared from my place again, and stood in front of Gazelle. Before she could fight back, I easily attacked her nerve points and left her paralyzed. She fell to the ground. There, all done. I said before looking into the distance where Master Rhino was standing, completely helpless. He was still injured and with internal injuries at that, so he was completely completely incapable of fighting. I used Shumpo to cover the distance in only a few steps, and appeared in front of him. He was spooked, but before he could do anything, I grabbed him by the horn and spun around with him. Then I flung him into the air, throwing him with every ounce of strength I could gather. His body sailed across the sky, and I used Shumpo to return back to my position. I stood there and waited for a few seconds until I heard a scream from above. And then Master Rhino fell right before my feet. I looked at his pathetic self for a moment and sneered. When he tried to push himself up, I grabbed him by the back of his neck and pushed him back on the ground. I crouched down and whispered in his ears, Look at this. I said and showed him the destroyed road and the surroundings. The broken trees and the devastated earth were proof of our battle. And on that broken ground were his students and comrades. The Monkey King was nowhere to be found though as he passed out. And his body was sent flying quite far away with my kick. I'll show him the promise I made before the fight rang in my mind. Look at it. I yelled and forced him to look at his situation, at his reality. I showed him his weakness. I could kill them all. I wouldn't lose a single thing by killing all of them. It will have no effect on my reputation as I was already considered evil anyway. I could not be declared a criminal because although they were rulers of Gonjman City, it was only because they inherited it by chance after the death of the last peacock ruler. Plus Gongmen City was just a city in the end. It did not have enough influence to brand someone a criminal to the whole of China. There will be no chaos or war, as Lord Shen will simply return and rule over the city with ease again. There is no power vacuum to be left by killing them, so no civilian would suffer. They were members of the Kung Fu Council, a band of warriors, so their death in battle was something no one would make a fuss about. I have nothing to lose. I could kill them all, but I wouldn't because I am kind. I would spare their lives simply because I was good. This is strength. I said to him, loud and clear. It requires strength to be good. You need the power to be kind. I left them alive not because it was convenient to me, 
or because I had no choice. I spared them just because I was good. It was my goodwill, something he claimed he had showed me by allowing me and welcoming me to his city. But in reality, he could never show me goodwill because he was weak. How dare he accuse me of betraying him? Imprint this moment in your mind and make sure there is humility in every step you take from now onwards. I said and let him go. I stood up and looked at the battleground for a final time. Before I disappeared from Thaya eyes. I left them to despair by themselves. I used Shunpo to return to the place where I was first attacked and picked up my bag before I continued my journey. To the east. The east coast was very far from here and located at the edge of China. So I will simply make that my final destination and visit other cities and kingdoms along the way. I stopped using Shunpo. And I bent down after a while. That battle actually took quite a toll on me. I said and heaved a sigh. My body was tired and I was running low on my Kai. When I said I was running low on Kai, I meant my original white Kai. My natural reserves before I got the memories of my past life. There was still the blue Kai deep inside of me, unused and completely full. I was accustomed to using my white Kai, and since it was in the outer later, I always used it first. I was not very comfortable with using my blue Kai, as it was so deep inside my body, and it felt foreign. But I have tested it before, and I could still use it in an emergency. So in Turth, I nearly used up half of my Kai, which was still a bit concerning since it was a huge amount. My white Kai alone was probably the biggest in the world other than Po, as the amount of Kai you have, and your strength are directly connected. And even before I got my blue Kai, I was already the strongest. So not only did I already possess the biggest amount of Kai other than the cheap Po, but that was doubled after I gained memories of my past life. But I wouldn't let my huge reserves get into my head. What just happened was unacceptable. I need to get better at using my techniques, so that I would waste less Kai after executing them. I probably shouldn't use the enhancement that I copied from Monkey King again either. That waste a shit ton of Kai. I need to learn to be more efficient. And with such thoughts running in my head, I continued walking along the wide road. The first leg of my journey had officially to an end. I wonder what other events awaits me. Third POV Master Rhino remained on the ground even after Tai Lung had disappeared from sight. He sighed and shook his head while he digested what Tai Lung had said and done to him. The guy does not hold back does he? He said to himself while chuckling. He slowly pushed himself up from the ground and got back to his feet. Maybe he needed that humbling. He had indeed gotten prideful of his own achievements and position in the passing years. That had happened to anyone when you are the leader of the Kung Fu Council, where the greatest masters in China worked under you, and also have the greatest city under your rule. All of these had almost made him forget the ultimate truth of this world. That his individual strength reigned supreme. His influence, his rule and his prestige were nothing in front of overwhelming strength. The fact that Tai Lung had just walked all over his pride and got away scot-free was proof of this. He went to the other masters one by one and checked on their condition. They were all fine, no one was on death's door, although some were beaten pretty badly. He undid the nerve attacks Tai Lung had left behind. But even after they were free, no one moved. They prefer remaining on the ground for a while, sulking in their defeat. Master Rhino laughed, you better get used to it, now that he's back. He found it funny that once Tai Lung terrorized his generation, and now he is back, after 20 years and still looking not a day old, to terrorize the new generation. You almost sound happy to have him back. A voice came from behind Master Rhino, and when he looked back, he saw the Monkey King. He was also battered up pretty badly. But Master Rhino had seen him in worse states before. You chose to come back right when it's all over. Master Rhino asked while raising his brow. His voice held a hidden amusement as if he was continuously holding back from laughing at Monkey King's current state. What do you want me to do? Come back to the guy that just sent me flying a mile with just a kick. No thank you. I was waiting for him to leave. Monkey King admitted with a smile. Master Rhino shook his head, you should have come back sooner. He was giving me the Tai Lung treatment, and you missed it. Monkey King paused and his eyes opened wide like a saucer. Are you kidding me? Nope. He told me to make sure there is humility in every step I take from now one dot quote he said, and the Monkey King started laughing. He even started making monkey noises while slapping his knee. He wiped a tear from his eye, you might be the only master in China who gets the Tai Lung treatment not just once, but twice. How can someone be so unlucky? Monkey King asked with his laughter slowly dying down. But I guess it was needed, you were getting pretty cocky. It was true indeed. Master Rhino's ego was hurt when he lost that badly to Tai Lung, and he believed that Tai Lung won purely because he somehow attained inner peace. So when Monkey King, who also attained inner peace, finally came to Gongmen City, 
He thought together they would definitely be able to take Tai Lung down for good. But there was also his anger at Tai Lung for attacking the land of his citizens. Yet it was true that if Monkey King was not here, he would not have gone after Tai Lung. Don't act innocent, you also called him arrogant. Master Rhino rebuked. Monkey King sheepishly scratched his cheek. I did, didn't I? I didn't think I would be beaten that badly in the beginning too. In fact, I thought I had a chance after achieving inner peace. Guess I was wrong. By a mile. Master Rhino added while smiling at the double meaning. It was your idea, which you immediately agreed with because you think you can beat him. How long has it been since he broke out of prison? Monkey King asked after thinking about it for a while. To be beaten so thoroughly was something he never thought was possible considering how much he had grown. About a year. I see. He did not see. Wait, a year, a little less, Master Rhino said. Then that means he was always that much stronger than us. I have attained inner peace, and although it gave you more enhancement and the ability to do the impossible, it is nothing much. Especially if you only had time to get used to it for a year, Monkey King said. What a monster, he added. What do they feed him in prison? Master Rhino questioned. Do you think I should go to prison too? Try my luck in attaining inner peace or something? I think it's just a Tai Lung thing. Rather than due to his imprisonment, Monkey King said as his eyes wandered around and observed his fallen comrades. The others, they are fine. Master Rhino said, strangely enough he left everyone with their life and with no permanent injuries. Of course, except Ox, Tai Lung broke his horn. That's a minor thing. It won't affect his fighting power much other than the need to get used to his imbalance. He can make a sword or other weapons with his horn. Monkey King said while stroking his beard. He seemed a bit confused and deep in thought. Why did he spare us? Showing mercy is not like him, especially to those who so blatantly crossed him. He thinks he is good by doing so, Master Rhino said. I think his desire to be the dragon warrior did not fully die down. He still wants to be the hero from what I can tell. Monkey King scoffed. That's funny. It is. You'd expect someone who attained inner peace to be more aware of their true nature. He is not the type at all, in fact, none of us are, Master Rhino said. Well, inner peace is simply about accepting yourself and being at peace with whatever you have happened to you in your life or what you have done. The journey of self-discovery is never-ending. The road continues on until the end of your life. Monkey King said, take today for example. I never knew I was this helpless against someone else. Master Rhino thought about that for a while and in the end, just remained silent. It was good that Tai Lung at least still wanted to be the hero. It was good for everyone who came across him and the world itself. He had never missed the old tortoise more than he did at the moment. Someone needed to keep Tai Lung in check. At least he hoped the new dragon warrior would get strong enough to equal Tai Lung. If anyone had a chance, it was the warrior selected by Yu Wei himself. Finally, his soldiers reached the battlefield, and he ordered them to take the fallen masters back to the city, while he went towards the farmland of the Y House to check what exactly happened. He did not find anything suspicious of course, as the fight provided enough time for Lord Shen and the Y family to clear out any evidence. In the end, they said that the explosion was caused by the fireworks they kept at the storage which were meant to be used for celebrating the Lantern Festival. The Lantern Festival is celebrated in the first moon after Chinese New Year, and it's significant to farmers, because it marks the beginning of spring, and the start of farming activities like planting seeds and plowing. Master Rhino believed that as it seems reasonable, and he had no reason to trust Tai Lung's words, more than his own citizens. In the end, he just chalked it up to a way for Tai Lung to vent his anger like he did in Milan City. He had heard Tai Lung was not welcomed well into his city, and left in a rather foul mood, right after Gazelle talked to him. He needed to do something. At least he needed to spread words about Tai Lung's strength to everyone. The old tales needed to be retold. He'd rather not have anyone mess with Tai Lung and piss him off at the moment, and he needed to talk with other kingdoms as well. They need to make a plan on how to neutralize Tai Lung. I case he went on a rampage again, and the dragon Warira was still too green to stop him. They didn't have Ugwe anymore, so they have to find a way. To Master Rhino, it was only a matter of time until Tai Lung turns evil and go on a rampage again. He did not believe for a moment that he was good because even Ugwe said so. Tai Lung wanted to be hero, like the dragon warrior and Ugwe. What a joke. Third POV Zhang Wai, report. Shen ordered his subordinate while he was busy tending to his injuries and broken feathers. He was currently at the house of Wai in Gongmen City, because where is a better place to hide than plain sight? The place was the main hall of the Wai house, and other than the patriarch of the Wai clan, there was no one else, as Shen wanted to be alone to think at the moment. We've managed to clear the place of all evidence while the fight was taking place Lord Shen and Master Rhino also did not suspect a thing. The Kung Fu Council had also returned to the city, 
with most of them injured, but no one received a fatal or permanent injury. Zhang Wei, the sheep reported diligently. He was a traditional man who believed that the peacocks were the true rulers of Gonjun City. It did not matter to him if the air was evil or not, to him it was all an important part of destiny to shape the future of the city. To let outsiders rule the city which his ancestors, under the kindness of the royal peacock, had built was completely unacceptable. There was also the fact that the current rulers were warriors with no business sense or scholar's wisdom. So they were not bringing profit to the city. He thought that not only was he doing the right thing by helping Shen, but his action would also help his clan to become more powerful and influential. When Shen inevitably returned to his throne, they managed to fight off Tai Lung. Shen asked in utter surprise. No, quite the opposite Lord Shen. Tai Lung easily defeated them all, but left them alive. Quote Shang Wei answered. Shen opened his mouth to speak, but words got stuck in his throat as a million thoughts crossed his mind. Tai Lung left them all alive, and he didn't cause any injury. The first thing that came to mind was why he spared them. But on second thought, it made sense. Tai Lung did not kill any of his soldiers directly either. It seems he needed to reevaluate Tai Lung's nature and morals a bit. So he is someone who is not opposed to killing, but would rather spare a life if he could. Or was it a mere show of his strength? Because it was obvious truth that it was easier to kill a person than defeat them. So Tai Lung sparing his opponent could be a way for him to show off his power. He seemed like the type of guy to do so. That also caused another concern for Shen, and the main reason why he was so shocked. Tai Lung was able to take on six significant members of the Kung Fu Council, and that too, while limiting himself to no killing or inflicting vital injuries. That'd mean that he should be able to take on double that if he went for the kill. Even more, if the battle was in his favor. That put him in another threshold of power. A single person with the power that rivals a kingdom, Shen muttered to himself in disbelief. If Master Rhino could slay 10,000 serpents alone, if the Furious Five could defeat entire armies, then definitely Tai Lung held the power of an entire kingdom in his hand. Shen shook his head to throw away the useless thoughts. He could think about Tai Lung later, but now he needs to focus on more important matters. Then what of the Kung Fu Council? From what I have heard Lord Shen, Master Lizard and the Monkey King, are planning to leave Gongmen City soon to warn their respective kingdom which they protect. Master Ox and Croc were in bad condition, and would take months to fully recover. Zhang Wai reported, and as he talked more, there was a glint in his eyes. Master Rhino, like you already know is still injured. He said, so what shall we do Lord Shen? Shen revealed a cunning smile. I question Zhang Wai. Do you still have the cannon I asked you to smuggle inside the city in case of emergency? Of course, Lord Shen. Then call the boss wolf and order him to send the pack to the city immediately. We strike them when they are weak, so report to me immediately after the Monkey King and Master Lizard leave. Shen ordered as he reclined back on his seat again. This could be advantageous to him. He had suffered loss in his confrontation with Tai Lung but the same guy provided him with the perfect scenario for him to take back the city. But he must not be hasty. He will tread carefully from now on, and consider Tai Lung a walking calamity rather than an enemy. A calamity which could potentially spell his doom or a force of destruction he could direct at his enemies. A double-edged blade, a grin tugged on the beak of the ever-cunning bird. He believed that it was not always the strongest that won the war, but the one with a plan. He has a plan. Third POV, the Jade Palace, Tai Lung went into Gongmen City, and came to Master Rhino, where he issued a challenge. The ruler of the city and the founder of the Kung Fu Council agreed. The duel was held the next day, and the result was an easy victory for the infamous warrior Tai Lung. Shifa read the message scroll with great attention as Po and the Furious Five listened to everything in rapt attention. That's not all. Two days later, Tai Lung left the city, but due to provocation by the citizens, he went on a rampage and destroyed the farm of the Wai Noble House. The Kung Fu Council immediately reacted, and six people confronted Tai Lung. They were Semicolon, Master Croc, Master Ox, Master Gazelle, Master Lizard, Master Rhino and the Sage of the West, Monkey King. Shifu paused and everyone held their breath. Not just six masters, but they were the toughest bunch in the Kung Fu Council. And that includes the Monkey King, who was often compared to Uguay himself. The result of this conflict, an overwhelming victory from Tai Lung. Not only were they not able to catch the criminal, but they were left alive by Tai Lung to spread his powers and strength. This is a message to all of the masters and kingdoms of China. The warrior Tai Lung is back, and with this action, he declares himself to still be as powerful as he was in the past. The Kung Fu Council had issued a red warning, do not engage or provoke the warrior. If an unavoidable conflict arises between any party and Tai Lung, they are requested to inform the Kung Fu Council immediately. Shifu put down his scroll and with faraway eyes, he said, issued by the Kung Fu Council of China. 
There was a pause, a moment of absolute silence between everyone as they processed the news. That was until Po spoke out. I can't believe it, Senior Tai Lung is so fucking cool. He yelled out and raised his hands. The silence was completely broken as everyone cheered. Tigress folded her arms and nodded with a proud smile like a younger sibling proud of his older brother. Just as expected her face seemed to say. Master Shifu also had a smile on his face as he read the message again and again. Of course, what was written on the scroll was a little different than what he read out. The real message was much meaner towards his son and seemed to want to spread bad rumors about him. But Shifu saw through it and simply relayed the unbiased information to his students. What did the scroll mean by saying Tai Lung brutally mauled Master Ox? by breaking his horn and stabbing him in the back to try and cripple him. If his son truly wanted to cripple someone, the message will say he did and not just try to do so. And if they mention Master Ox in specific, that means that it was the gravest injury Tai Lung inflicted. And Shifu thought they were rather lucky, and Tai Lung was merciful to let them off that easy after being wrongly accused. Yes, Master Shifu did not believe for a second that his son simply attacked the farm due to his anger. His son had attained inner peace, and he himself had seen it. Tai Lung was no longer the type to be controlled by his anger. There must be an explanation. He had complete faith in his son. Shifu couldn't help but get annoyed at how the message seemed to make an excuse for the Kung Fu Council's loss against Tai Lung. By saying stuff like how Master Ox and Master Ko couldn't eat for two days, since their teacher was injured, and how Master Lizard and the Monkey King were exhausted from the journey where they encounter bandits, so they were not in full power blah blah blah. But the message was still meant to warn the others. Yet how could anyone take it seriously, if the message claims that Tai Lung won by chance, and the Kung Fu Council could take him down anytime. So they did that by making Tai Lung out to be like some evil warrior with mental health issues who can go berserk anytime. That way, the Kung Fu Council save face, but still conveys the dangers of Tai Lung to others, instead of making Tai Lung out to be a powerful beast, which everyone should be careful around. They describe him like a spiteful insect with deadly poison which they should avoid. In the end, both actions got the same result, people being careful around or avoiding Tai Lung. Yet the other saved their face, so naturally they would choose to save their face. If they simply revealed that Tai Lung was strong enough to take on all of them, and told the truth that the Kung Fu Council did no have enough power to control Tai Lung, then there would be no need to badmouth his son. That kind of strength would naturally demand respect and wariness from everyone. But alas, such a prestigious organization would never do something like that. They had pride and a reputation to maintain. Shifu after attaining inner peace found it all so vain. If you can't be proud of your truth, that's not even pride but arrogance. The truth was that Tai Lung was strong enough to completely turn China upside down at this point. If the kingdoms unite against him and launch an allied attack and tired him out, that's the only way Tai Lung can be defeated. But surely Tai Lung won't fight against kingdoms, right? Right. Whatever. Too much thinking in life was not good. He should enjoy the moment. He was happy to see his son so strong and was proud after all. And that calls for a celebration. Let us celebrate the victory of your elder brother Master Shifu said. And everyone cheered. Tai Lung's POV two months later. It has been a year since I broke out of prison now. And I was still in the middle of my journey towards the east coast of China. It should have taken me a week at most with my new movement technique and speed. But sometimes, it was the journey and not the destination that you desired. I have continued my training and used the many bandits and criminals I encountered as training dummies. I have also looked into the nature of Kai itself, and how Monkey King supposedly used his Kai to enhance himself, and even do the palm attack. My conclusion was that Kai was an energy that could be shaped however the wielder wanted to. It seems to respond highly to the imagination slash visualization, will and belief of the user. In my training to be more efficient in my use of Kai, I have found that if you have great imagination slash visualization, will and belief then the cost of Kai to execute a technique is a lot less. That gave me a whole new perspective on how I saw Kai, and it really solidifies the name I give. The fuel of miracles. You can increase your visualization slash imagination by meditating, your will by hard training, and you can strengthen your belief by knowing the concepts behind the technique, or giving logic to what you are doing. If you lack one of these things, the techniques can still be achieved by compensating with a lot of Kai. But if you were great in all of these three aspects, you can execute techniques easier and with a lot less Kai. These three things make it easier to create miracles and to achieve the impossible. From this, you can see why Kai could be so different depending on the nature and character of the user. It gave me a new perspective on the teaching of the Dragon Scroll which was, you do not need a secret ingredient. To make something special you just need to believe that it is special. Belief was one of the things that made a huge difference when using Kai. For example, 
If you see someone execute a technique before, you will have an easier time believing in yourself to be able to learn that technique. Or if you have a scroll that explains the concept and logic behind the kung fu or technique you are trying to learn, it becomes a lot easier to believe. Or in my case, have the knowledge that it exists in other worlds, and saw characters execute it before. This also helped in the visualization and imagination part. But the tricky one was having the sufficient will. I assume that if there were two injured people in front of you and one of them was someone you love and truly wanted to heal, while the other was an enemy and someone you hate, you would have an easier time healing the person you love, as you truly had the will and intent to heal said person, while you might need a lot of Kai to heal an enemy. I did not know how much these things affect the usage of Kai exactly, but I knew it had an effect. Kai seems to be a highly flexible energy and power system than initially expected. This would explain how Po was able to use the Waxy Finger Hold, something thought to be a legend, and what masters use to scare their students. Po was enlightened that you just need to believe that something is special to make it special. So he had belief. He also had a shit ton of Kai and the will to put the movie Tai Lung away for good. There was no description of how the Waxy Finger hold work exactly other than that it was lethal. So Po must have visualized or at least wanted to imprison the movie Tai Lung again to a place he could never escape from. Thus the technique materialized as a way to banish someone to the spirit realm. At least these were the theories I have come up with. It was hard to learn more than that in such a short time without any materials to help me. I did not have thousands of years to study it like Ugwe did. The damn tortoise, he could have at least left some writings about it. Other than the new things I have learned, nothing much happened while I was traveling. The few masters I came across all rejected my challenge to a duel for some reason. So what else could I do? Attack them anyway. The rumors about what happened in Gongmen had also spread, and like always, the people like to make up their own stories. I have been hiding my identity with my cloak, so I did not notice much of the reaction they had towards me. But I was not worried. My reputation could not get worse than it already was. I was done trying to prove anything else or try to get a good reputation by my actions. The last time I did that backfired on me so I learned from my mistake. They could talk about me however they want. The reason why I cared in the first place was because of my desire to surpass the legacy of Ugwe, which wouldn't be possible without being accepted and worshipped by the people. But I have come to realize that it was a futile effort. The path you walk shall not lead to glory as you wish. Your quest for validation a failure. For destiny is not kind to those who defy her. The universe worked to right the accident. History remembers a villain you never wished to be. Your legacy and ambition died at the hands of someone whose is was forgotten. The prophecy Soothsayer had told me came to my mind. At first, I thought I would achieve what I wanted by staying close to Poe and saving the world every time in his place. By doing that, I thought I would be plundering his future legacy and his fame. But I was wrong, Poe would be the one taking all of my credit instead. I was not like Poe or like Ugwe. I was me. So I stopped trying to walk the path to glory. And I just walked my own path. Isn't that funny? I was trying to be something I was not. And I was not even aware of it. I was not the hero who saved the world from evil. I was not the pacifist whom people would come to respect. I was something else. I am Tai Lung. If I want to leave a legacy and create a mark that history will remember, I will leave the legacy of Tai Lung, and not just that of the hero or something I was not. You see, it's all about the journey. I got my character development while I was on a journey to Juniper City. There was just something magical about traveling that you end up finding yourself before you find your destination. I was currently in the Kingdom of Wu which was the most significant kingdom in the East. The kingdom thrived due to its access to the ocean, which gave them control over the waterway of cargo and ships. This was the kingdom that supplied most of the foreign items in China. The famous Juniper City was also under the Kingdom of Wu. Another noteworthy fact was that it was also the birthplace of the infamous criminals, the Wu sisters. I walked around one of the cities under the Kingdom of Wu, and there was no reaction from the people, as I hid my face under a hood. I made my way towards the market to eavesdrop on some gossip and news, while also trying out the foods they have here. I have been avoiding the cities while I was traveling because as I said before, I was not very fond of cities. But you need go to a city once in a while to keep up with the news and rumors. I entered the marketplace and I focused on my hearing. But I was not prepared for the news I heard from the people. Third POV Master Rhino is dead. Shifo declared after reading the message scroll. What Po and the Furious Five who were all summoned by Shifu screamed in shock. You mean Master Thundering Rhino? The son of the legendary Master Flying Rhino? Po asked in disbelief. Yes. 
The Slayer of the Ten Thousand Serpents in the Valley of Woe, yes. Shifu confirmed, and Tigress immediately came forward with a solemn face. Was it Tai Lun? She asked the question that have been on everyone's mind. If someone killed Master Thundering Rhino, then the only one capable should be Tai Lung. I thought so at first too, but no. It was Lord Shen, the banished prince had returned. Shifu said as he started walking down the steps of the Jade Palace and went towards the gate while deep in thought. His students followed him. How? I thought Master Rhino's horn defense was impervious to any technique. Except for Tai Lung's of course. Crane asked. It was no technique, it was a weapon. One that breathes fire and spits metal. Lord Shen had created a weapon of destruction while he was banished. And the Y family helped him sneak the weapon into the city to kill Master Rhino. While he was injured, Shifu said, That must be why my son attacked the Y farm outside the city. He had seen through their ploy and tried to stop it. But they didn't listen. Shifu immediately made the connection. In the end, his faith in his son proves to be true. Tai Lung did not attack mindlessly. But there was a reason. He was trying to stop the disaster, but they were too blind and foolish to see it. So what are we going to do? Po asked in a sullen tone. That was the question in everyone's mind. They were not supposed to do anything as it was different from the canon. In the movie, Lord Shen declared war against the whole of Kung Fu itself, claiming the weapons he created to be the end of Kung Fu. The Jade Palace had a deep connection with Kung Fu, so it was natural for Shifu to order his students to destroy the weapon that threatened them. But this time, Lord Shen did not declare war against Kung Fu, because of Tai Lung. He also knew his weapons were inferior to the true might of Kung Fu from his confrontation with Tai Lung. So there was no reason for them to interfere. It could be said that Lord Shen was just reclaiming his throne, and from what the message implies, he even has the support of the noble houses. The Jade Palace had no reason to interfere. As mentioned before, the Jade Palace was neutral with no support for any kingdom or politics. But Shifu felt that they should interfere. It was almost like the universe was urging him to make a move to complete a destiny. After attaining inner peace, he had such gut feelings as if the universe was speaking to him. Something bad was going to happen, and he could already guess what it was. I am going to send you all on a mission. You go to Gongmen City and observe how Lord Shen is treating the people, and gather any information you can about this weapon. Shifu said, of course, the Jade Palace did not have any political inclination, but they were always on the side of the people. Are you sure, Master? I don't think we should interfere in such things, Tigress said. Shifu raised an eyebrow, wondering if that was the truth, or if she did not want to help the city that discriminated against Tai Lung. Yes, I have known Lord Shen since he was a kid. He was always ambitious, and he will not stop after he reclaimed his throne. Shifu said and touched his beard thoughtfully. There will be a war. With his new weapons, Lord Shen will seek to conquer the whole of China. Shifu said, War was nothing new in this day and age. Although minor, there was always an ongoing war between kingdoms, and the Furious Five have even participated in some. As long as the kingdoms followed the codes of war, there was no reason to intervene. Of course, a great war was a different matter where the codes of war have been totally abandoned. There have been no such wars in over a century, and the great war that was about to break out two decades ago was stopped by Tai Lung. You will enter the city normally and request a meeting with Lord Shen. When you are inside, you will accomplish your mission of gathering information, while also giving a letter I will be sending to Lord Shen. Shifu said with a nod. Then he turned around and went back to the Jade Palace to write a letter. It was an official letter by the Jade Palace. That would congratulate him on regaining the throne, and also an advice slash warning from the master of the Jade Palace, to Lord Shen. It will remind Lord Shen to not take hasty action, and to respect the code of wars, in the process of realizing his ambition. Even if Shifu did not have the gut feeling, it was natural to send the letter, as Gong Men had always been a city for Kung Fu masters. So they need to be in good relationship with the rulers. But of course, things would not be simple, as Lord Shen would definitely want to kill Po. After learning he was a panda and a dragon warrior to boot, he will never allow the one destined to defeat him to live. But they did not know that so Shifu sent his students on their way to Gongmen City. They were to observe the condition of the people under the new ruler, get information about this weapon, and give the letter to Lord Shen. Tai Lung's POV, after Master Rhino's death, the people of the city said that Lord Shen muffled words. I did a double take and almost choked on my own saliva after hearing that. What in the Uguays and us were they saying? Master Thundering Rhino is dead. Hey, I went to a stall that sold spices from India and asked the shopkeeper, what are those guys saying? Something about Master Rhino's death. The shopkeeper was a dog, so he could also hear the conversation taking place many feet away. He looked at me with a bored face and nodded, yes, 
They are talking about the death of Master Thundering Rhino. It was quite a shock even for me when I first heard it. When did this happen? A couple of weeks ago. Mate, don't tell me you only heard of this just now. Where have you been living? Are you some village kid? The dog said while chuckling as I left the shop after tossing a single coin at him. So it was true. Master Thundering Rhino is dead, and the plot for the second movie is finally starting. I felt a small sense of loss in my heart. Although I did not like Master Rhino at all. He was a fellow warrior and a great master of kung fu. Amongst the masses, the ones who had attained the strength he did were few. And a warrior like him were fewer. So it was a great loss for the world. He was currently in his prime too. But the main question in my head was why this was happening. Why did Shen attack now? I thought for sure it would take more time for the second movie to start. And if we consider my interference with Shen, it should have even been delayed further. Yet it was already happening. The question remained on my mind as I tried to make sense of what had happened. Is it my fault? I thought to myself while I walked out of the city. Did Lord Shen move his plan forward due to my actions? If it was two weeks ago then he must have taken advantage of the Kung Fu Council's weakness to reclaim his throne. That must be it. I said to myself and I started sprinting towards West when I was out of the city. I should have known. Now things have become complicated. The first image that came to my mind when I realized the second movie had truly started was my students and my sister, completely broken, at the mercy of Lord Shen. My mind played the image of the innocent Po being blasted away by a cannon, and the image of my sister pushing Po away, and bearing the full destruction of the cannon. They were so close to death and defeat in the movie. But now that I've changed things, I couldn't be at peace leaving them at the whims of fate. Who knows what could happen? I know the dragon warrior would somehow pull a victory, but at what cost this time? The last stand Poe did in the movies wouldn't work anymore, because Shen had seen me do it. Poe, Tigress, Mantis, Monkey, Viper and Crane. They were my juniors and the few people in this world who didn't see me as an evil monster. I need to be there, right now. Come on I screamed and ran on all fours. My speed was a blur as I sprinted back to where I came from, Gongmen City. But I was already two weeks late. The journey between Gongmen and the Jade Palace was a week, and I managed to cover the distance in five days. Considering the news of Master Rhino's death took two days to reach the Jade Palace, and for Master Shigu to send them all on a mission, I was already a few days late. I have to reach Gongmen City as soon as possible. Flash steps. I said before I closed my eyes and entered in a piece. Flash steps or shampoo that I have recreated was from the Anime Bleach. It was a movement technique with combat in mind, so it was not that great to cover huge distances quickly. But there was also another movement technique that goes by the same name, but from a different Anime called Uck Holder. The concept behind this specific flash steps was to grab the world with your feet. The main character had to train using his feet for months before pulling off this move. But I did not need such things as I was a snow leopard. I could use my front and back limbs with almost equal dexterity. And the master of flash steps who taught the MC was a werewolf so I had an advantage in my body. I have been trying to recreate this unique flash steps before, since it gave you the ability to walk in the air. But so far, I have not seen results. Yet that couldn't work this time. I need to do it. For all I know my students could be captured and in the hands of a psychotic bird. Another movement technique called air walk slash gepo from the world of one piece came to my mind as I used both of them as a reference to learn more about duck holder flash steps. Catch the ground. Grab the earth. Catch yourself the moment your feet touch the world, and control the friction, so that your movements do not kick up even a speck of dust. Focus on the vectors. I also used Hinkun to learn more about flash steps, and after running for a while, I opened my eyes with a new light in them. Grab the world with your feet. I did. I kicked off the ground, and before my momentum ended, I kicked the air and grabbed the world itself. My feet found a solid foothold as I grabbed the world, and I kicked myself up again. Then again, and again and again until I was a blur faster than any bird could ever hope to fly. I continued kicking the air and I ran in the sky. I easily moved across the landscape that way. With my new speed, I was traveling in record time. Don't worry juniors, senior brother is coming. I joked with a smile to ease my beating heart as I shot across the sky of China. Third POV. How are the prisoners? Do they like the food? Lord Shen asked as he sat upon the throne of the peacocks in the Tower of Sacred Flames. I think so, 
My lord. They finished half of what they were served. Boss Wolf said while bowing respectfully towards Shen. Half. Do you think half is enough? Do they not like the food? Shen said with a thoughtful look. Find another chef. It is possible that they do not like the current one. Yes, Lord Shen. And what of their accommodation? The prisoners are currently staying in one of the best inns of the city, reserved for the wealthy and located at the heart of the city. So any attempt at escape would be met with failure. Good, good. Shen nodded in satisfaction. And what of the panda? Is he still alive? The panda lives, my lord. Boss Wolf said and Shen released a breath that he did not even know he was holding. He felt like a mountain had been lifted off his shoulder. And, Soothsayer found him with her foresight, and she is taking care of him. He fell into the river after being shot by the cannon, and it carried him outside of the city. They are currently in the old village of the pandas, Boss Wolf said. The fact that the panda was in the place where he was born, caused a bit of concern for Shen. But he calmed down by telling himself that there was nothing much the panda could do alone, and the injuries he got would take at least a few days to heal. You may leave now. Keep an eye on the prisoners and make sure they are not harmed, especially the tiger. Shen said with a wave of his wing, as you command Lord Shen. Saying so, the boss wolf left the throne room. Lord Shen, the rightful ruler of Gongmen City, reclined back on his throne. There were four strong gorillas who stayed around to protect him at all times, but they stood still and silent like a statue. So there was silence in which Shen could gather his thoughts. A person without context would find the previous conversation extremely weird. They were talking about prisoners, but Shen was treating them like his royal guests, asking if they ate well, and if they had the best accommodation. It was not always like this. When they first came into the city, Shen saw the dragon warrior who also happened to be a panda, and his first thought was they are enemy. The warrior destined to defeat him also happened to be the dragon warrior. You couldn't fault Shen for trying to complete his work 20 years ago. He ordered his soldiers to seize and capture them. They claimed they came in peace, but there could never be peace, Shen was sure of that. A great conflict ensued. The Furious Five and Po proved to be a stronger adversary than he could have ever imagined. They took out many of his men and went into hiding for a few days. They even tried to free the prisoners, Master Ox and Croc, to help them defeat Shen. But in the end, it was all for naught. With his cunning and by manipulating Po, Shen was able to capture them. And he even sent the Dragon Warrior away with a cannon shot. He took in the Furious Five as prisoners, and as is in the Code of War, Shen did not kill or torture them. But in return, the Furious Five also answered any of his questions. Lord Shen had learned many things from the prisoners, most of which he wished he had known beforehand. They really did come in peace, and even brought a letter from the Jade Palace which Shen discarded with a wave as the Jade Palace did not hold much influence or power after Uguay's death. But the most important pieces of information he learned which he wished he knew beforehand was the fact that they were students of not just the legendary Master Shifu, but a student of Tai Lung as well. This would explain why they could take out so many of his soldiers easily, and why they were stronger than expected. But that was not the worst part. The next thing he learned that made him pale, was the fact that the panda was supposedly Tai Lung's favorite student, and Tigress was Tai Lung's younger sister. Lord Sheng could only curse at the universe and try his best to mend his mistakes. He made sure the prisoners were treated well, and he sent out his men to search for the panda immediately. If it was not obvious already, Shen was doing all this because he did not want to get on the bad side of Tai Lung. As he said before, Tai Lung was a walking calamity, something that could either end him or become a force of destruction. He could aim at his enemies. Lord Shen was smart and confident enough to declare war against the whole of China, but he was also smart enough to not mess with Tai Lung. Tai Lung was the only person that could stop him. He was Lord Shen's kryptonite as the weapons he was so proud of did not work on the Snow Leopard. Lord Shen also picked up the letter from the Jade Palace he discarded at first, and read it carefully, before sending a reply letter to accept the kind gesture. It was because Tai Lung had a close relationship with the Jade Palace, and considered it his home apparently. Shen should have deduced that already, the rumors about the Dragon Warrior and Shifu keeping him there were absolute lies. No one could hold or suppress Tai Lung like that, he stayed in the Jade Palace for 10 months, because he liked it there, and considered it his home. Such a trouble, Shen said to himself. He was both annoyed and awed at the fact that one person could put a complete stop in his plans. It was like having Ugwe himself all over again. He waited so many years for that tortoise to pass, and now Tai Lung had appeared. He needs to think of something quick. A few days later, you are afraid. Soothsayer commented as she watched Shen pace back and forth in the throne room. Po had already learned about his past and attained inner peace. 
But unlike the movie, he did not have to go and save the Furious Five. Instead, he was just put in the same inn as them, and held as a prisoner there. Now, Soothsayer stayed with Shen in the throne room as his trusted advisor. Soothsayer had a duty to always serve under the royal Peacock family. It was a promise made long ago, and one she was determined to keep. No matter how she felt about the current lord she was serving, he was the last descendant of the Peacock, and she had to serve him dutifully. And she also felt responsible and guilty as the one who raised Lord Shen. It was also her prophecy that drove the prince to commit such atrocities in the first place. He was her creation, so she stayed with him in hopes of fixing things. Or even if she can't, she would complete her duty as an advisor. Me, afraid. Shen paused and asked with wide eyes. What a great observation you have truly worthy of being called soothsayer. I didn't realize I was afraid. It's not like I was feeling it from the pit of my stomach, and it made me unable to even sit still. He hissed towards soothsayer sarcastically. I don't see why you are so afraid of Tai Lan. When the warrior destined to defeat you is right in your city, the panda is not a threat. Lord Shen declared, at least not yet. And even if he were to defeat me, that would be it. He is gullible and soft-hearted. He said and locked eyes with soothsayer. Tai Lung would tear me apart. He whispered, and he has the power to do so. Individual power. That was Shen's weakness, unlike Tai Lung, whose weakness was huge armies that would eventually tire him out. Lord Shen tore his eyes away and continued pacing back and forth with a solemn expression on his face. Soothsayer released a sigh. She did not like seeing the one she served be in such a distress. She felt the need to help Shen in some way, no matter how little. A memory clicked in her mind. I've actually had an encounter with young Tai Lung when he came to the city. You did. Shen stopped and looked at her with focused eyes. He sensed something important coming. Yes. And I dash she hesitated for a moment before the sense of duty won out. I looked into his future and gave him a prophecy. With a flutter of his wings, the wind in the room turned into a small hurricane as Shen appeared in front of Soothsayer. His eyes were red and they held seeds of insanity. Tell me, he demanded. He thought that if she looked into his future, she might know the outcome of the confrontation that was about to take place. He did not even question why she broke her promise and used her gift on people outside of the royal family. He had more pressing matters occupying his mind. I was not able to look into his future properly. I only saw brittle glimpses of it. But the prophecy goes something like this. Soothsayer said calmly. A warrior unlike anything the world had ever seen. With a heart that could not decide black or white. Not a villain yet far from a hero, draped in the shades of grey. The path he walks shall not lead to glory as he wishes. His quest for validation, failure. For destiny is not kind to those who defy her. The universe worked to right the accident. History remembers a villain he never wished to be. His legacy and ambition died at the hands of someone whose is was forgotten. There was a long silence as Shen took his time to process her words, and analyzed each and every sentence she had uttered. He slowly moved out of her face and turned around before heading towards the balcony of the tower with slow steps. Although they did not give any direct information, he could break apart the different layers of meaning behind the sentences of the prophecy. Something clicked in his mind, and he felt like he knew Tai Lung more than he ever did before. A sense of weird camaraderie bubbled in his heart. Shen had constantly been thinking of ways he could put Tai Lung down, or how he could use him, but he had not come up with an answer so far. But right now, a new possibility came into his mind. Tai Lung's POV using flash steps to fly across China was quite taxing for my body, as I felt my legs numb due to the strain. My Kai reserves were also plummeting at an alarming rate, since I was not too proficient with the technique. But I pushed on because I could see the metropolis city ahead. It took me less than a day to cover the distance I took two months to cover by fort. A Bliot, I was in no hurry when I traveled on land. I used my heightened senses, my hearing and my acute sense of smell to observe the city ahead. The smell of iron and gunpowder was thick in the air. I could see huge smoke rising from factories and buildings. They were probably creating more cannons for Shen. I continued kicking the air, and when I was right above the main entrance gate of the city, I stopped kicking and allowed myself to fall. I could have just entered the city and directly go to the palace. But I did not want to risk anything before I got more information. For all I know my students could have not come to the city. They could be on the run from Shen or they could have been killed. I wanted to get some information first before barging in and falling into a trap. My cloak came off as I was falling from the sky, but I made no effort to retrieve it. A deep frown graced my face, and my throat vibrated to produce low-pitched growls. E boom I landed on all of my four limbs right outside the city gate, and the many guards stationed there gawked at me in utter surprise. 
My landing created a small crater in the dirt road, and the shockwave sent small pebbles flying. My yellow eyes narrowed as I scanned the surroundings. My ears twitched to hear the many footsteps that came from other places, rushing here to check what was going on. My nose took in the smell, searching for the faint scent of gunpowder as I searched for any cannon station there. My eyes observed the wolf and gorilla soldier stationed ahead. I swiftly judged their strength from the way they held their weapons, their muscles and the quality of armor they were wearing. My sensitive paw sensed the ground, noting that it was made of dirt, and it was damp. I should be able to move easily without any fear of slipping. All of these observations were done on instinct and in just a single second. My long tail whipped behind me as my muscles tense ready for movement. I stood up slowly as the guards still looked at me as if I was some illusion. The gravity of the situation had not quite settled in their mind. There were 13 of them stationed right outside the gate. Five of them were gorillas, while the rest were black wolves. Soon enough, they shook their head and finally reacted to my presence. The biggest gorilla amongst them whom I assumed was the leader yelled out. Get him the soldiers rushed towards me. But before they could get close, I disappeared. There was no sound produced by my movement. The air was not displaced, and there was no footprint on the ground. Flash steps. I moved at a speed untraceable by their eyes, and when they saw me again, I was already past them and stood directly in front of the gorilla who gave orders. They all paused for a second, and then a dozen of them fell on the ground, paralyzed. I had hit their never points even before they could realize what was going on. Thump. X-12 the gorilla who was the only one left took a step back in surprise. I let out my claws and sunk them at the side of his face. Before I brought him down to my level, he gritted his teeth, but he was frozen in fear. He was too scared to even fight back as I looked him in the eye. Tell me, have the Dragon Warrior and the Furious Five came into the city? I asked with a threatening edge to the vibration of my voice. I expected him to give me an answer. But even if he did not, I have no problem with it. I chose him for a reason. He had a big body which meant more bones I could break, and more muscles I could tear to get my answers. Lucky for him, he answers my question instantly, yes. They are currently held as prisoners in Bax Yangin. His voice cracked in the end due to fear, but I heard him clearly. Are they alive? Yes. All of them are unharmed. Lord Shen ordered us to no harm them. He said even the Dragon Warrior too. I hummed at his answer before I delivered a swift nerve attack on his neck. That made him fall to the ground limply. His answer got me curious. Why are they all held as prisoners? And why did Lord Shen still spare them? He also said Lord Shen ordered them to not harm the prisoners. What is he planning? Is he trying to hold them as hostages against me? One way to find out. I thought to myself before kicking myself up in the air, and I made a beeline to the top of the Tower of Sacred Flames. I now learned that my students were indeed captured and held as prisoners, so I could finally act. I flew across the ginormous city in a few minutes before I found myself directly above the tower. I flanked in the air and kicked as hard as I could to propel myself downwards. I crashed through the tile roof of the tower, and landed directly on the top floor which was the throne room. Crash I broke through the roof, and the clitter clatter sound of pieces of tiles falling on the ground, filled the empty room. It was dark and eerily silent, with no guards to be seen. I would have thought no one was here if not for the presence I sensed on the balcony. I turned my head to look at Shen who was standing on the balcony a few meters away. His back was facing me so I was unaware if he had any weapons but I was ready for sharp projectiles. I have been waiting for you. He said softly yet in the eerie silence, his voice was loud, and it echoed. He turned around as his majestic wings and royal robes fluttered due to his action. His eyes confidently met mine, and there was a friendly almost good-natured smile on his face, which was something I did not expect, considering how we met last time. Greetings Tai Lung, we meet again. He said with a courteous bow benefiting of an elegant ruler. I was thrown off by the whole thing and I did not know how to respond, so I narrowed my eyes at him and became alert. You do not have to be wary. I just want to have a talk with you, he said, and your students are safe and under great care. Shen slowly walked towards me, his metal talons made a clicking sound as he walked, and they made me very conscious of the many hidden weapons he might have under all that feather and robe. I know you are someone who does not like to beat around the bush, so I will cut straight to the point. He said, I have a proposal. A smile benefiting the devil on your shoulder appeared on his face. Third POV Schiffer opened his eyes and looked into the horizon. He was standing on the top of his staff and meditating until he felt a disturbance in the flow of the universe. He had received a Relpy letter from Lord Shen, so he knew his students were not in danger and treated as guests, so he wondered what the feeling he had was about. The wind suddenly picked up pace, and a powerful gale blew on Shifu while he looked at the sky. 
The once clear sky was gone as dark clouds filled the sky. The world rumbled as a storm without rain brew above. Shifu noted that it was an awful lot like the storm on the night Ugwe passed. When his master had said there was an accident, whatever was happening the universe did not like it. Shifu was not sure, but threw in a piece, he could feel it. The universe was throwing a tantrum. In the kingdom to the west, Monkey King snapped open his eyes to look at the sky above. His eyes glowed in his kai as he blinked once before he creased his eyebrow. Something was wrong. Similar scene could be seen happening across China as everyone with a deep connection with the world could feel something was wrong. They did not know what. They did not know where. But they felt the distress of the universe. Tai Lung's POV, I have a proposal for you. He said and stood just at the right distance. He was close enough so that we can see eye to eye, yet he was just out of my reach. The balcony was also open and right behind him. It was to be his escape route if things went south and I attacked him. I raised an eyebrow, a proposal. I sure hope it has nothing to do with ordering me around in exchange for my student's release. I said with a humorless chuckle. Oh, I won't even think of such T-H-I-N-G-S tilde he said with a smile. People say I am crazy but I am not that crazy. So then, what is this proposal that you speak of? I asked in an impassive voice without hints. Shen let the silence stretch as he stared me straight in the eye. He was trying to show his utmost honesty and sincerity in what he was about to say next. He'd have to do more than that to even pique my interest though. And he did. He took a step to the side and started walking around me. With each step he took he came closer to my reach. And each step took him further and further away from his escape. Now that piqued my interest. Maybe what he was about to propose was more than just one of his cunning ploys. I want an alliance. He said and I paused. Out of all the things I expected, this was not one of them. I half expected him to ask me not to interfere with his business or give me a threat. But an alliance. Now that's something I did not expect. An alliance between me and Gongmen City. I asked. It was not rare to see an alliance between a powerful master and a city. The Monkey King of the West was an example. He formed an alliance with a kingdom and became their guardian. And in exchange, he held a high status there and got any resources he wanted. No, Shen said and stopped pacing around me. I want an alliance between you and me. That sentence had a whole different meaning behind it, although they might feel similar. It means that even if he stopped being the ruler of Gonjin City, we would remain an ally. Naturally, I laughed. I could understand if he wanted an alliance between me and the city, but between him and me. The audacity baffles me. Being in an alliance requires both parties to benefit from each other or share similar interests. I wonder, what could he possibly give me? What would I benefit from working with him? Why would I even want that? I asked in genuine curiosity. He gave me a small smile before he started pacing around me again. I turned my head and focused on him as he said, because that way, we both would be able to achieve what we want. We, I asked, you think I want to start a meaningless war just because of your delusion of conquering China? You want a legacy, Shen said and changed direction. He started walking up to me ever so slowly as I stayed silent. You want glory. You want to be remembered until the end of times, Shen said with wide insane eyes. You want a legacy that surpasses even the likes of Wu Gui, the person who locked you up and denied you what was rightfully yours. You want to be. He draws and stops in front of me. His eyes pierced through mine and looked into my soul. More than a dragon warrior. My eyebrow relaxed as I looked at the bird in front of me. I did not know how, but he was somehow able to tell me exactly what I desired. To be the strongest and to leave a mark in the annals of history as the greatest, surpassing the likes of Ogwe himself. I can't be the dragon warrior. The universe rejected me. Destiny betrayed me. So I wanted to be more. I know that because we are not so different, Shen said and slowly walked backwards away from me. I wanted to surpass my great ancestors and have the whole of China by myself. I wanted to bring glory to the royal peacocks. And I wanted more power than any kings ever had. He said and raised his wings. But destiny won't allow me. My parents betrayed me hated me, and I was burdened with a self-fulfilling prophecy that I have fought against ever since. He said, yet I keep on fighting and I will continue chasing after that dream. If it eventually leads to my demise, then so be it. I would die trying. He said, he was a lot more different than what I expected. He was not the psychotic delusional bird shown in the movies. In fact, he was more like what he became by the end of the movie. The bird who accepted his own demise. The one who clings to his ambition to the very end. You said that conquering China was only a delusion of mine. He said, but it won't be a delusion if I have you by my side. He was awfully humble when he said that sentence. Shen in the movie thought he was unstoppable. But after I showed him otherwise, he changed his arrogant and haughty behavior. At least when it came to me. Become my ally. With your help, I would be able to conquer China. And in return, 
I will give you the legacy and glory you always wanted. With your strength and kung fu, coupled with my intelligence and weapons, we would be unstoppable. I will finally have the control and power I always wanted, and you will have the legacy you desired. He said, together, we can both achieve our ambition. He finished off his speech with a smile. Now silence filled the room as I took in his words. I thought about it carefully and if I was being honest, it was not a bad idea. The path you walk shall not lead to glory as you wish. Your quest for validation, a failure. Soothsayer's prophecy rang in my mind. I realized then that I was trying to follow in Ugwe and Poe's footsteps to achieve what I wanted. I was walking down a path not made on my own. I promised myself that if I was to be remembered, I would be remembered as what I truly am. Tai Lung. Not a hero, not a saint and not even the strongest. They will remember me as Tai Lung. I plan to stay close to Poe and save the world when any threat arises. That way, I thought the people would accept me and remember me. I thought I would leave a legacy like that. But that path would only end with failure. On the other hand, what Shen proposed was a very attractive path. If I worked with him, I would have weapons and armies by my side. I wouldn't have to worry about armies which can overwhelm me and defeat me. Not only that, the best place to grow stronger was by fighting. What better chance to fight than in wars? If I wanted to get strong enough to defeat Kai before he returns, it was only right that I take a path that could make me stronger. So, you believe I will be able to achieve my ambition by conquering China with you? I asked and Shen smiled. He asked me one question that immediately caught my attention and directed my mind to uncharted territory. Why stop there? I have never said this out loud before because people were already calling me crazy for wanting to conquer China. But the truth is he said and opened his wings to show his majesty. I want to conquer the world. He said and his pupils dilated burning with madness. He was even crazier than I thought. But what an interesting idea. I can't help but like the idea of conquering the world. The names of great figures from my past life came to mind. Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, Napoleon Bonaparte, Julius Caesar, Cyrus etc. All of them were great conquerors who wanted to rule over the world. History never forget their names, even if they failed to truly conquer the world. If I were to do the same, surely I would leave a legacy that surpassed Uguay's whose influence stretched only to the landscape of China. To try and conquer the world. I have never even thought of that before, because it was an impossible feat to achieve alone, no matter how strong I became. Even if I could become strong enough to defeat kingdoms, governing that much territory was not an easy feat. It would require a royalty who was taught from a young age and with the necessary education. I would also never be able to sit around and rule a kingdom. I was made to fight, not to govern. But with Shen, it became a possibility. I did not have to worry about all the politics or governing. I could just take territories and put him as the ruler to manage it. I turned on my heel and slowly walked towards the balcony while I was busy in thought. I could see the sky darkening and storm clouds were rolling in the sky. Ka Chang. A flash of light cracked between the clouds, and a deafening thunder shook the sky. I stood at the balcony, and the intense gale blew on my fur, foretelling a storm. The universe was in distress. So, what do you think? Shen asked as he slowly approached me from behind. If you need more time to think then you can have all the time you want. He finally stood by my side, and I gave him a side I I don't need time. I accept your proposal. It seems interesting. The sky rumbled and lighting struck the world. The universe cried as two villains once wronged by fate and destiny, decided to join forces. The universe could not right the wrongs. The accident escalates. It was not just China this time. The world was not prepared for the storm that is approaching. Tai Lung's POV. I accept your proposal. It seems interesting. I said and Shen was oddly surprised at my answer. Really? Just like that? He asked me with a raised eyebrow. I thought I would have to do more to convince you. I am not clueless like most warriors Shen. I can see how an alliance could benefit me even without you having to name them one by one. I said with a scoff. What I am more interested in is how you plan to proceed after this. To be completely honest with you. I didn't think this far ahead. He said with light chuckles. You could tell that he was absolutely ecstatic at the moment. I thought even if I did not fail, you would at least take a few days to think about my proposal. He said and waved his wing. That was not a meaningless action as I saw all of the cannons which were aiming at the tower from a distance, lower their aim. It was the same thing that happened in the movie. He was willing to bring the down tower in hopes of killing me if things went wrong. I knew he wouldn't have confronted me without any preparation. That means if things went wrong and I kill him, he was determined to at least bring me down with him. Turley a mad bird. But after our alliance is declared officially, I plan to appoint you as the supreme general of my army. You will have all of my soldiers under your command. And you will also be responsible for training them. Shen said, a general. Hey, 
My lips stretched into a smile as the prospect felt a little silly. After all the talk I had about not following Uguay's footsteps, I seemed to do the opposite and follow behind him. I remember Uguay also used to lead armies when he was young. And your plan on how to defeat the other kingdoms? I asked and Shen shook his head with a smile. It doesn't matter anymore after I have you by my side. No one can stand in our way, he said. You have quite the confidence in my strength, don't you? Of course. I have seen it with my own eyes. And after we conquer China, then what? Then we wait? Shen said, we gather our resources and unite the kingdoms before we begin our conquest. Do you think it would be that easy? No. I know there would be problems and challenges along the way, but two things gave me confidence. He said, the rest of the world do not have any clue on what gunpowder even is. They do not have dynamite or fireworks much less something similar to my weapons. And Kung Fu is not widespread like it is in China. The rest of the world lacks powerful warriors and masters, although I have discovered that they have other forms of combat, it is ultimately inferior to Kung Fu. He said, in a sense, I think it would be easier than uniting China. I hummed at his words although I did not agree. There was no way the rest of the world would be weaker than China. Although Kung Fu may not be practiced like it is in China, I was sure that there would be powerhouses around the world. Of course, they wouldn't be able to match me, but they won't be pushovers. I looked at the horizon, the storm clouds were slowly retreating. It goes as quickly as it suddenly comes. I looked around the city below us, and I touched the fence surrounding the balcony. A weird memory came into my mind in that moment of seriousness. Hey, do you remember the time I pushed you off this balcony? I asked and turned towards him. He paused for a few seconds, recalling the memory before he quickly took steps back. Why do you bring up such unpleasant memories? You said you could fly. You knew I couldn't. He hissed at me. Although we were not exactly friends, we were the same age and were often forced to spend time together whenever we visited Gongmen City. He was always arrogant and haughty when he was a kid, and after getting annoyed, I insulted him by calling him a bird who can't even fly. He took great offense in that, and claimed he could fly. In the end, like I said I pushed him off this very same balcony to give him a chance to prove his words. He did not fly, but that was the day he learned how to glide. Your students are in Baxiang and located in the Noble District. They must be waiting for you. Since we are done here you should leave. He said, I shall summon you when the time is right to get into more details about our alliance. I smirked at him before jumping off the balcony, and I headed towards the inn to finally meet my students again after nearly three months. Third POV Shen remained on the balcony for a long time, even after Tai Lung had gone to meet his students. He watched the city below with a permanent smirk on his face, as if everything was going exactly according to plan. Eventually, someone came to disturb his peace. Soothsayer walked up to him. Her cane and footsteps made a clanking noise in the silent tower. So he agreed. Xu Seiya said and stopped right behind Shen. He turned around to look at her with a victorious smirk. He did. Are you serious about this? Or is it just one of your cunning tricks to destroy your enemies? Su Seiya asked with eyes narrowed with curiosity. Shen chuckled. There are no tricks this time. No amount of trickery or manipulation would benefit me more than an honest alliance. So you really plan to work together? You are willing to share the glory with him, or more likely than not, get outshined. Soothsayer asked. She laughed, yes. I figured the whole world was big enough to share between two people. I will have the power and control I always desired, and he can have the glory and legacy he wanted. So it's not just China anymore, but the whole world, huh? Soothsayer said in a calm voice. The cup you wish to fill is made of greed, Shen. It has no bottom. You don't know that. You don't know me. Maybe not. But your parents, she said, but was cut off by Shen. My parents hated me. Shen said in a heartbreaking voice. They wronged me. He said. His parents had always promised him the throne and all of the glory and power it holds. They promised he will be the great ruler of Gongmen City. The one who would bring the city to height, never before seen. He had worked to do just that all his life. Yet in the end, they banished him and stripped him away of that promise. In a way, it was similar to how Tai Lung was promised to be the dragon warrior, only to be denied in the end. It was because of this promise and the sense of responsibility to achieve great things, that he did not see the beautiful colors in the fireworks. He only saw the explosion, and his parents hated him for seeing the explosions. He still remembered the eyes of disappointment and disgust they threw at him, when he excitedly showed what else he could do with the fireworks. They looked at him like a monster. He just wanted to help. He just wanted to fulfill his responsibility. He just wanted to show them who he really was. Well, they saw him. They hated him. He had heard of great kings conquering and defeating other kingdoms. They expanded their territory and established an unquestionable rule of power. 
Shen thought his parent would be proud if he had done the same. But no, he still remembered the night of his banishment, when he came home after massacring the panda village. He thought they would praise him for defying destiny, and for breaking the prophecy. But the looks they gave him, the curses that left her mother's beak and the words his father spit at him, disowning him. It sticks in his mind forever. It scars. I will make it right. Shen said with a voice filled with psychotic determination. Shen felt so wrong because he thought he was so right. His methods were correct, and he would prove it to his parents by conquering not just China but the world as well. Do you think then you would finally be happy? Will you finally be healed? Soothsayer asked before the silence stretched too long. Scars don't heal, wounds do. Shen rebuked. But yes, after I have China and the whole world under me, I will be happy. Soothsayer stills and stares at the hatchling which she had watched grow into what he is now. She then turned around and walked away. But not before leaving her final words. You are right, scars don't heal. She said, they fade. And happiness is not a destination, it's a direction. Are you happy with what you are now and what you are doing? She did not wait for an answer but walked away from Shen, leaving him to watch her back as he contemplated her words. Shen was not happy with he is or what he was doing. He could not let go of his past, and he remained hurt forever. And he hoped the future would magically be better for him. He can never learn to accept the present. Lord Shen, the bird who could never let go. Third POV, we need to act fast and complete our mission. We must find out more about the weapon and report back to Master Shifu. Tigress said to her fellow prisoners in a serious voice. They were currently in the largest suite of Baxiang Inn, held as prisoners of war with every exit tightly guarded by guerrilla soldiers. As the name would suggest, the suite they were in was built with all the luxury that ancient China could afford. So the Furious Five and Po were enjoying their stay even if they were prisoners in name. Are you even listening to me? Tigress asked with a helpless sigh as she watched her fellow students enjoying the luxury they were given. Monkey was sleeping lazily on a hammock and he was using bananas instead of a blanket to cover himself. Viper was currently receiving a massage from a small and nimble rabbit that cracked and adjusted her spin, much to her comfort. Crane was standing in one corner and was surrounded by different books of novels. He was contently reading them while plugging his ears, so he did not hear what Tiger said at all. Mantis sat on top of Crane's hat, idly reading the book as well since it was about romance. Poe was a little further away from them, and he was eating from the table, which was filled with different dishes from all across China. They were made by different chefs, and Poe didn't forget to ask all the recipes of any dishes he liked more than the others. Guys Tigress yelled out and finally caught the attention of everyone in the room. They looked at her with questioning eyes. We can't just stay here forever and simply wait to be rescued. We have to do something, she said in frustration. It felt like she was the only one taking the mission seriously while her friends were easily distracted by everything Lord Shen threw at them. Um, dot dot I mean, what else are we supposed to do? Mantis asked with a shrug to which everyone else agreed. From what they could see, Shen was not enslaving the people of the city or starving them. And he was also not trying to deploy his armies to launch an attack on China like he did in the movie, since he waited for Tai Lung. So there was really not much to do. I I don't know, Tigress began. But what I do know is that we can't stay here forever. Po. She called and turned to the panda who froze midway through putting the steamed bamboo shoot in his mouth. You are the dragon warrior, so you should decide what we are going to do. She said and every eye suddenly turned to him. Even the rabbit who was massaging Viper. Po slowly put the bamboo shoot in his mouth and swallowed loudly. I mean, we can stay here for a few more days and wait for Master Tai Lung to come. If we leave so soon, we'd be throwing away his efforts of saving us right. That would be rude. He said and got the nod of agreement from the others. What? We can't just sit here like ducks and wait for him. Besides, how do you know for certain that he is going to come to a rescue? Tigress asked. Oh, the old goat lady told me. She said Shen has been waiting for Tai Lung, so he had not made any moves yet, and I trust her. Po said she can do these voodoo. Looking into the future, Thinji. But still, we can't just do nothing. She said, feeling a little ashamed already at the thought of Tai Long coming to save them without them doing anything. Would he be disappointed in her? Or maybe we can. Monkey said, I am pretty sure Shen will not do anything stupid as long as Big Brother Tai Long exists. Viper laughed, yeah. Did you see the way he froze when he learned Tigress was his sister? She hissed. The others laughed remembering the almost panicked look on Shen's face, and the way he ordered his soldiers to release her from her chains immediately. Man, I wish I was his brother too. Mantis said, or maybe I can be his son. You know I never really knew my father. 
It was because my mom ate his head before I was born. Next time we get interrogated, how about I tell Shen that I'm Tai Lung's secret son? You guys will support me. Then maybe I will be allowed to get out of this inn and search for my own fair lady. Mantis said. Gong Men City was known for its ladies and resort. He thought that if he were to find a wife of his own, there was a high chance of that happening in the city. But alas, he was a prisoner. Although it was luxurious and had you could get any material thing you could dream of, you couldn't get love in a room. Mantis, I don't think anyone is going to believe that, Viper said. Why not? It's Tai Lung we are talking about here. Plus, he has inner peace, meaning he can do impossible things. His seeds being able to impregnate another species doesn't seem so far-fetched. I think you are forgetting the most important part. Crane said and his eyes looked up at Mantis. How is he supposed to get in there? Oh, Mantis muttered in realization. You're right. I didn't think about that. But not a second later, a creepy smile crossed his face, and so did Crane's. There must have been something that gave them an idea amongst the romance books they have read. Well, he can always see Rude Dash Guy's Viper hissed. Could you not Poe is here? Oops, almost said it out loud. Sorry, Poe, I forgot that you didn't know about that yet. Mantis said, and Poe looked around in confusion. What do you mean? Woke Poe said with a fake laugh as if amused. I can totally understand what you guys are saying. He could not. Panda was innocent, and it hasn't even been long since he learned he was not Mr. Peng's real son. We are getting off track here, Tigress yelled and brought them back to the earlier topic. Crane, any idea on a possible plan? She asked the main brain of their team. Crane released a sigh and closed his book before taking a few seconds to think. We are at the ground floor, and the bathroom is directly connected to the drainage system under the city. If we break the floor of the bathroom, we should be able to access that pathway to escape. He said and Tigress's eyes lit up. But are we sure that we should do this? What if they capture us again and they don't show us good will next time? Crane followed up with another question of hesitance. Crane had always been a warrior with a heart of gold who was righteous in spirit and heroic in his character. So his show of hesitance meant that he didn't think there was something wrong they needed to stop. It was true that most of the citizens were in panic and were fearful, but that was only natural after the sudden change of rulers. And Shen had not shown any actions of needless violence or malice. In his mind, he didn't think there was any need to stir up trouble. Why cause conflict for the sake of it? They were in the city after all, and if a fight did break out, the people would suffer in the end. But he also respects Tigris, and if she felt the need to act, there must be something wrong. Since she had always had a good gut feeling, Crane realizes that sometimes, the most logical thing can be wrong, as it is directly based only on present information. Tigress stayed silent for a while, wondering if she should follow her friend's judgment. But how long exactly were they going to stay here? No matter how nice it was, they were still prisoners. They have had no contact with the outside world. What if Shen was hiding something? What exactly is happening in the outside world? They have been here for four days now, and they need to get out. They shouldn't be suppressed forever. We have to do this. She said, everyone, get to the bathroom. We are busting out of this place. Everyone stopped what they were doing, and the rabbit quickly got out of the room. They got up from their seats and were about to move, but a voice from the window suddenly stopped them. You guys do realize the waters would be dirty, right? Everyone paused and looked towards the window. A snow leopard with a robust stature stood in front of the window. He stood at around 6-8 feet tall, and he had a muscular upper body filled with muscles that seemed to be carved from jade. A small smile stretched across his lips, displaying his sharp lower canines. And although he had no ill intent towards them, a certain pressure took hold of their heart. It was an aura only possessed by the strongest confidence that came from overwhelming strength. Everyone took a moment to process the situation before they all showed myriad of reaction, mostly shock and relief. I am sorry this is the first question I ask. But how long have you been standing there? Mantis, as the quickest amongst them, asked first. A while. How much did you hear? I heard everything. Tai Lung deadpanned. Mantis blinked. It was Crane. He smiled first. Hey, don't blame me. And what do you mean I smiled first? You can't even see my face because you are literally standing on my hat ouch. Crane yelped as Mantis stabbed him with his forelins. How did you do that? Viper asked curiously as she slithered forward. She meant the way he could sneak up on them. As a snake, she was very acute to vibrations, and could easily sense anyone even if they did not make a sound or are invisible. So the fact that Tai Lung could sneak up on her surprised her. I have mastered the ability to stand so incredibly still that I became almost invisible to all the senses. Tai Lung said, and then everyone finally noticed that he was indeed standing still. That would explain why Viper couldn't sense him. He didn't move, so there was no vibration. There was a moment of silence as everyone stared at him, waiting for him to magically disappear in their eyes. That was until Poe broke the silence. Whoa, 
is that the stealth technique of Master Chameleon which he developed during the Shanbei invasion, so that he could sneak into the enemy's camp, and assassinate their commander. Po asked excitedly with his pupils dilating in excitement. Tai Lung raised an eyebrow. It was always impressive to see Po's vast knowledge of Kung Fu in person. He was undoubtedly the most knowledgeable in the team when it came to Kung Fu. Yes, that is so awesome. Po said, you could have killed us all even before we know it if you wanted to. But I thought it was only possible with the help of a chameleon's special skin. Many things become possible when one attains inner peace. Tai Lung said, it was not hard to pull off the technique since inner peace was basically becoming one with the world. It naturally had a stealth aspect to it if one really wanted to be stealthy. Speaking of congratulations on attaining inner peace, Tai Lung said as he could feel Po's endless Kai constantly leaking out from him. Unlike Tai Lung who could enter and exit the state of inner peace, Po was constantly in that state. He was leaking out his Kai around him and was constantly affecting his environment. There was no control over his Kai, Tai Lung noticed. But unlike what others would have thought, it works well for Po. If Tai Lung were to stay in a state of inner peace constantly, his Kai would inevitably run out after weeks or maybe months, even if he did not do anything. But Po wouldn't have to worry about that because the amount of Kai he had was endless. Literally endless as Tai Lung could not feel the depth of it. He could not tell how much Kai Po had. He thought he had a huge amount of Kai, but compared to Po, it was like comparing water in a lake to an ocean. Endless versus finite. Tai Lung was forced to reflect upon the privilege of being the universe's chosen one. Maybe Kai exploding due to so much Kai after Po gave his Kai to him was not just a bullshit for writers to make Po win. That part was always sad to Tai Lung even in his past life. General Kai who had constantly been training his Kai for 500 years. That too in the spirit realm. Where you could learn a lot of things about Kai than the outside world. Kai developed different Kai techniques. And even invented a way to steal others Kai. Yet he was defeated by a newly awakened Kai user. And that too, by just the quantity of Po's Kai alone. He was a spirit warrior, said to be immortal. But he was defeated just like that. Oh, you noticed. Po said while rubbing the back of his head with a proud smile. It felt great to be complimented by someone you admired. Yes, it's quite obvious with all of the Kai leaking out of you. Tai Lung hummed, wondering if that would have an effect on people. I will have to teach you how to control it properly. Tai Lung said with a smile. Some selfish people might think that it was not wise to teach Po and make him stronger. Po already had so much Kai. So what would happen if he was taught how to use it properly? Wouldn't his title as the strongest be challenged? But that thought never even crossed Tai Lung's mind. His mentality was that of the strong. If he was the strongest only because he put other people down, then he didn't deserve such title. He is the strongest because he is Tai Lung. If others got strong, he would just get even stronger to surpass them. Besides, he was a Kung Fu enthusiast, and would never miss an opportunity to witness the growth of the greatest Kung Fu master that will ever live. Yes, he believes that the future Po can surpass even Ugwe. He was the chosen one, after all, the protagonist of the universe. Plus Tai Lung would never deny a challenge. Tai Lung. Tigress finally spoke up before stepping towards him. He cracked a genuine smile while she remained serious. What is happening outside? She asked, what are going to do next? It was two related questions. What is happening outside? Was there chaos amongst the citizens and had Lord Shen made a move? And whatever the answer was, what are they going to do about it? Were they going to escape? With Tai Lung here they could just break out from the inn. There wouldn't be a need to be discreet. Or are they going to bring down Lord Shen? You guys are free now. Tai Lung said, and about what your next course of action, you will do nothing and return back to the Jade Palace. He said, and everyone nodded at his words. They put his words on the same level of importance as Master Shifu's. And the situation. Tai Lung drawled and looked at each and every one of them. Shen and I have formed an alliance. Tai Lung's POV Shen and I have formed an alliance. I broke the shocking news to them and watched as their jaws fell in shock. It was truly a piece of random and impactful news, one that even I was still processing. I never expected Shen to ask for an alliance. In fact, I expected him to hate me to the core for being an obstacle to his grand plan. But I guess you can't get in the mind of a psychotic genius. What? Tigris asked the justified question. Shen and I have formed an alliance, I repeated. You mean you decided to be the guardian of Gongmen City? No, I said, making myself clear. I have formed an alliance with Shen himself, and I will be helping him in his quest to conquer China. Everyone gasped at that revelation. At first, they were shocked, but now the hard truth was shoved down their throat, and they choked on it. Ooh, but why? Tigris asked me again. 
I could see the swirling of different emotions in her eyes. Anger, confusion, hesitance, hope, and even a flicker of understanding. Why did I ally with Shen? It was a great question, but one I would not indulge in answering. No matter what I said, no one would understand me or my vision. They lacked the knowledge to do so. They did not know of the future where Kai would return, and I needed to get stronger. They did not know about my ambition and dream, nor did they realize the extent to which everyone else hated me. Why not? I asked back with a raised eyebrow. Why not? Tigris repeated and stepped forward, Shen is evil. He was the one who destroyed Poe's village and killed his parents. There was a beat of silence as everyone looked at me, searching for my reaction to that news. They thought I would be surprised to learn such information about Poe's past. I know. I said instead of showing any other reaction, I was still not imprisoned when that happened. Everyone was stunned to silence. They all looked at me with varying eyes. But interestingly enough, Poe seemed the most unbothered by the whole thing. The kid had such a precious heart. You'd expect him to be the most upset amongst everyone. And even if he felt betrayed, it would be reasonable. But he just wanted everyone else to get along. He was just chill. I could understand why the universe chose him to wield unimaginable strength. He never wanted to hurt anybody. His heart belied no daggers or malice. So then why? If you know that why would you still want to work with him? She asked me. The thought that Shen was not a good person had cemented in their mind even if he acted differently from the movie. Being good or being bad has nothing to do with why I work with him. I said with a shake of my head. I form an alliance with him because Shen with his genius and weapons is powerful in his own way. He is powerful in a way I am not. I said, he is useful and we share the same ambition. I said, and Tigris thought hard for a while before she nodded in understanding. I smiled and reached out to pat her head. You don't have to worry about it. Shen wouldn't do anything wrong as long as I am around. I will control him by force if I must. I said, I looked around the room and eyed each of my students one by one. There was not even a speck of wound on their body. So I was pleased. But then my eyes fell on the food on one table, and my nose instantly smelled the intoxicating aroma. I was hungry since I came rushing to Gong Men City, the moment I heard about what happened without stopping for food. Okay, let's eat first while we will all catch up. I said and headed towards the table. The Furious Five and Poe followed behind me, and we sat around the table. There was enough dish on the table for us all, and Poe ordered more food too. We sat and ate the multiple dishes. My students had smiles on their faces, as they were finally relieved of any stress they had prior to my arrival. How could they not be? Elder brother Tai Lung was here, and there was nothing they had to worry about while I was with them. I asked them about how they were while I was away, how their training had progressed, and how they came into conflict with Lord Shen. Crane was the one who answered most of my questions, even though Tigress should be the one. But alas, she was too preoccupied with devouring her fish that she couldn't even answer properly. I knew she would love fish since she was a fellow feline. Apparently, she was hesitant to eat any of the food Shen had given them, so she was just as hungry as me, if not more. We shared a wonderful meal, and after we were done, I told them they were free to roam around the city, and everyone except Poa and Tigris left the inn after four days. I spent the rest of the day with Tigris while simultaneously training Poa in using his Kai, and explained to him how inner peace worked. I was not like Ugwe who wanted to keep all the secrets to himself. I would gladly share my knowledge and who knows, Po would make a quicker breakthrough into mastering Kai than me, and I could learn from him then. And of course Tigris wanted to spend some time with me. She even asked me to teach her some techniques she could use in case a huge number of people attack her. She realized during the conflict with Shen, how she lacked the ability to take on multiple weak opponents even though she could fight powerful opponents. We also spent some time talking about Shen's weapons. Her official mission required her to get information, so I have her some. I told her how the cannons work and a way to counter it. That is to move around quickly, so that they could not aim at you, and to wet the fuse with water. The day soon came to an end, and my students all went to sleep as I allowed no one to stand guard. I told them I would be guarding them the whole night. Tai Lung's POV we stood at the main platform just outside the Tower of Sacred Flames. There were many soldiers below us, ranging from wolves, gorillas and a few other animal species. The 13 noble houses of Gong Men City were also there to witness the ceremony, as they stood at the forefront of the audience. There were probably more than a thousand soldiers, 
but the place was in absolute silence. It was silent to the point that their heartbeat was the loudest sound my ears picked up. The city was also in a complete lockdown. The citizens locked themselves up in their houses while traders and travelers were chased out. This was an important military event so certain exercises were executed. There were no such things as a microphone in this world, so there needed to be complete silence. Since the ruler was about to make an important announcement, every eyes were on me. Yet, I did not flinch or show the slightest hint of nervousness under the gaze of more than a thousand. The most prominent emotions I felt from the eyes were that of fear and anger. I could almost taste the fear in the air, and I smiled at that. Imagine a thousand warriors shivering at the sight of one. I no longer hated those eyes. I no longer wished they looked at me with admiration and love. I uprooted the very idea of being seen as a hero from the deepest part of my heart. This is me. I embraced their fear. I smiled at their petty anger, the anger of the weak. I learned to enjoy the way everyone held their breath when I looked at them. I enjoyed the way their hands instinctively went to their weapon due to my mere presence. Shen stood beside me and addressed the crowd, officially announcing our alliance to the world. Suffice it to say, that everyone was shocked. But I could see some smart nobles and the commanders of the army smile with every word Shen uttered. Shen gave a speech about the future, how he and I would conquer China and unite the Ten Kingdoms once and for all. But in this great conquest of ours, Shen said we needed them. He promised to bring glory and asked his subjects to give him all of their support to fulfill this ambition. He was a great speaker with charisma unmatched by anything I have ever seen before. I was impressed by his speech, and the way he spun words into a spell that cultivated loyalty in his subjects. It reminded me of the politicians in my past life. For so long, our land has been scarred by countless wars. The peace we have is but temporary, a thin veil that hides the true darkness. He said with powerful words. His sentences were not hurried and left a mark on everyone's heart. It was not only because of Shen's charisma either, but also because it was mixed with the truth. The land of China had never seen true peace in all of its years. It was not like my past life where China had different dynasties, and was ruled by one big empire which changed only after centuries. This world was much more complicated than that. Wars were not won only by soldiers but by masters of Kung Fu, and with each of them being able to change the tide of wars by themselves, there can never be a permanent wielder of a major power. Even if one kingdom seems stronger than the other, one amazing warrior would pop out and change the power dynamic in mere decades. That was why China was never under one domination, and the kingdoms were in a constant war for territory. There were ten kingdoms in China, and under the codes of war introduced by Uguay, they waged wars against each other. A great war was when more than half of the kingdom participated in war and disregarded the codes of war. But there have been no such cases in a long time. But that doesn't mean wars have stopped though. At least two to three kingdoms were always in conflict. A great example was the war for control in the West during which the Monkey King came into power and put a stop before things settled into a conclusion. As I said, one master can change the war in an instant. The rulers of the Ten Kingdoms will never be satisfied. They will continue to wage wars and slaughter each other due to their own greed, Shen yelled out. The thin veil of peace had also been destroyed after Uguay's death. When he was alive, we could look at him in times of need, but he is no more. The kingdoms had also noticed this, and they are preparing themselves for a great war again. With the one who maintains peace in this land gone, China needs a new moderator. This world is cursed, and the incoming disaster is so great that it calls for me, a banished prince. And I will do whatever I can to fulfill my duty my destiny together, Tai Lung, and I shall accomplish what no one has been able to do in the history of China, in the history of this world. With my weapons and with Tai Lung's unparalleled strength, we will go through China like the most violent storm after a perpetual drought. We will wage a massive war against the Ten Kingdoms, but with unstoppable force, we will force China to its knees. Shen said and paused to let his words sink into the crowd. And what a great war it will be. He whispered yet his voice could be heard from anywhere. It will be unlike anything this land had ever seen, surpassing the previous great wars by a huge margin, but this time it will not be for naught. After all, a storm even though it is violent, destructive and is thought to be evil, it will bring back life to our land once more. The cursed soil ruined by drought will finally get the rainstorm it requires. China shall get the correction it needed. He looked ahead at the horizon as if peering into the future and he slowly stepped forward to get closer to the crowd of soldiers and nobles, who were entranced by his presence. It will be a war that will end all wars. The silence was suddenly broken like glass, 
The deafening cheers and screams crashed into the world. It was so loud that it shook the whole city and rumbled like thunder through the space. The look in the eyes of the soldiers and nobles was that of fanatics, ready to throw away their lives for the great purpose that Shen had presented them. Of course, what Shen said was all but fabricated words. They did not know that. Shen walked back at me with a pleased smile on his face, which got tainted with evil, when he turned his back on the crowd, he took a small dagger from his robe, a curly dagger decorated with gold, diamond and jade. Shen cut his own wings and let his blood spill on the sacred ground. While he said his oath, he promised to become my ally and a brother in arms as we went on our conquest. I did the same after and cut my own hands and let my blood spill on the sacred grounds. In my name, in my blood, and in the name of Kung Fu, I promised to fight for our ambition until the very end. It was finally official. Lord Shen presented me with spiky shoulder pad armor to signify my position as the Supreme General of the Army. With that, I held even more authority over the army than he did. I walked forward to the thundering crowd looked at me with fear and respect in their eyes. After Shen's great speech, my reputation had also been greatly boosted as someone who shared the same dream. Behold the warrior who will lead you to victory. Supreme General Tai Lung Shen declared, and I raised my hand to the exploding soldiers. They cheered for a long time until all the soldiers kneeled before me. Then the wolves started howling. The gorillas beat their chest, and every animal made a sound of respect. Like it had been said before, it was an alliance, even though it would make more sense if I worked under Shen. But I did not, so that meant that although Shen had the whole city in such a great army under his rule, I could rival it with my strength alone. That was a feat worthy of the utmost respect. I looked at the cheering crowd and the kneeling soldiers. It felt so perfect. It felt so right. I could get used to this. Third POV after the ceremony was done, Tai Lung and Shen returned to the tower. They were followed by the family head of each house and the commanders of the army. Then, they proceeded to start planning for the upcoming war they were about to wage. Shen with his intelligence and Tai Lung with his knowledge of the art of war were the main brainpower behind the strategy they came up with. There was no need to delay the attack any further, as that would just give the kingdoms more time to prepare themselves. So they decided to attack as soon as the following week. The speech that Lord Shen gave in the ceremony was also recorded in a letter which was then spread amongst the citizens and to the rest of China. It was a declaration of war. China entered a state of awkward times as every kingdom prepared for the war, yet the kings waited for Shen to make the first move. Although Shen had declared war against all of them, the kingdoms did not work together to defeat him. Instead, they waited for the right opportunity and were always ready to take advantage of Lord Shen's attack. There were 10 kingdoms that currently ruled over pretty much the whole landscape of China other than the rare independent places like Gongmen City and the Jade Palace. There was the Kingdom of Dali and the Kingdom of Minyu in the south. They can be said to be the only two neighboring kingdoms that had a good relationship as they prospered in trade and maintained the Silk Route which facilitated trade between China and Southeast Asia. The Kingdom of Manzhou and Shu were always at each other's throats in the west with the recent war. Each of them had two powerhouses, Mighty Eagle and the Monkey King, which put them in a stalemate with each other. The Kingdom of Wu and Wai shared territory in the east and were once one giant kingdom, but it was split apart in a civil war with the criminals living in the Kingdom of Wu and the rest staying in Wayu. The Kingdom of Chu and Tang were located in central China, and never really at war with each other, since the Jade Papals occupied the border between them. Whenever a conflict was about to start, the Jade Palace would put a stop to it, before it could get serious. Tai Lung himself had been given a mission to settle disputes between the two kingdoms countless times. These two territories had a big influence since they were in the center of China, and there was a time in the past, when the dispute between them got so bad, that a great war almost broke out, in which more than half of the kingdoms would participate in one war. It was Tai Lung who put an end to this budding great war. And it was also the last mission Shifu gave Tai Lung as a test to see if he truly deserves the title of the Dragon Warrior. After which Shifu brought Tai Lung to Ugwe where the canon unfolded. It was due to this feat that the other kingdoms were more than happy to imprison Tai Lung, and even built the Krochgom prison to hold him. He held too much power and ruined many of their plans, so they took their revenge on him. How else would the Jade Palace have enough resources to carve a prison right out of a mountain and station, an elite 1000 rhino soldiers for two decades? It was due to the funding of the kingdoms. And lastly, the kingdoms of Jingnan and Zhu were in the north. These two were extremely hostile to each other, but would never go into a proper war, because invaders from Russia, Mongolia and Korea, were always ready to take advantage of their weakness to conquer China. It was due to this that the two kingdoms rarely dealt with the other kingdoms, as they were always busy fighting off invaders or with themselves. 
It was also because of this that they wanted more territory and power. All of these kingdoms were not allies, even though some might be on friendly terms. So none of them wanted to waste any substantial amount of troops, just to deal with Shen and weaken their force, so that other kingdoms could take advantage of them. Although Shen had his weapons and although they were powerful, his army was the size of a city and couldn't compare to the military might of a whole kingdom. If he were to disregard the codes of war, and launch a surprise attack on the main city of a kingdom like Shen in the movie was trying to do, then he might be successful in taking over one kingdom. Then he could take over the resources to build more weapons to conquer the other kingdoms. But with Tai Lung by his side, things have changed. With Tai Lung's neutral moral nature and his sense of honor as a warrior, Shen couldn't break the codes of war. But on the other hand, he now had enough power to rival the military might of a kingdom. Or maybe even more, Shen thought to himself when he realized the true value of having Tai Lung as a general. He was not only just a master of kung fu, but of war who learned many strategies and siege tactics from the library of the Jade Palace. But there was one other reason why Lord Shen changed his evaluation of Tai Lung. It was because of his innovative ideas. Of course, it was not hard for Tai Lung to give ideas as he had knowledge of another world. Especially when it came to the usage of gunpowder. Let's just say Tai Lung had to keep himself from saying too much. Shen with his genius mind could comprehend the true weight of Tai Lung's suggestion and immediately got his mind to work. And just like that, they brew up a plan to conquer the whole of China. The two of them worked together perfectly, as if they were always meant to be allies. They covered each other's weaknesses and truly became a force to be reckoned with. Third POV, a few days later, come on now pups, try harder. Tai Lung screamed at the wolf soldiers as they trained according to Tai Lung's instructions. There were more than a thousand wolf soldiers alone, as they lined up and executed different techniques with their weapons. They were currently in the middle of preparation for war, and even though it might seem foolish to train the soldiers now, when the war was about to start in a few days, that did not apply when the teacher was Tai Lung. Although it will only be for a couple of days, the training they received here would be priceless, and it would save the lives of many people, while also allowing them to eliminate more enemies. You are preparing for war. Forget about all the combat teachings you've had until now. Your aim is no longer to defeat the enemy, but to eliminate them with the least amount of effort. Tai Lung said before he clapped his hands suddenly. A shockwave erupted as the kelp exploded in a terrible sound. It was a wing technique that allowed someone to create a loud echoing sound of shockwave. The wolves nearby whimpered and fell to their knees. They covered their ears as their ears rang in pain. Learn to control your own senses. When the real battle starts, the cannons are going to explode with louder sounds. You can't get affected by it. Tai Lung said, scolding them. Wolves have a very acute sense of hearing like snow leopards and they needed to learn how to be immune to loud explosions if they wanted to fight in a war. The training ground which was outside of the city was bustling as they all learned under Tai Lung. He would approach the wolves one by one and decimate them while giving them advice. Stop swinging your sword like that. Not only are you predictable, but you can harm your own ally in a war. Tai Lung told the boss wolf, it's better if you can stab. Boss wolf was more adept with using a war hammer. But that was not a good weapon for war, as it wastes a lot of energy, and as one of the commanders, he needed to be fighting without stopping. Are those teeth only for display? Tai Lung asked, and right after, the boss wolf lunged forward to bite him. Tai Lung dodged and grabbed his maw. Good. And the teaching continues. Tai Lung could not train the guerrilla soldiers, as they were busy preparing the battleship and the cannons. But he made do with what he could and taught the wolves as best as he could. He dug into his memories and used his vast knowledge of Kung Fu to help them as much as he could with the limited time. As the Supreme General, he couldn't have incompetent soldiers. He also trained them in making different formations and taught them how to train even in his absence. Pain is inevitable, suffering is not. Tai Lung said as hundreds of soldiers groaned in pain while they did body training. Tai Lung trained them to exhaustion just to see how fit and strong his soldiers were. And although it could have been better, the wolves were to an acceptable standard. Learn to enjoy the training and know that the more you sweat here, the less you will bleed in battle. Tai Lung said to the wolves who looked at him with respect. So even when you feel pain, do not allow your mind to suffer. Embrace the pain, for it is proof of your improvement. Tai Lung said, and the soldiers nodded at their general. Now do it again. Tai Lung's POV so, you finally came back. Shifu said with his eyes closed and his back facing me. He was sitting in a meditative position on top of a single rock while the surroundings were covered with a shallow puddle of water. There was a dragon-shaped statue on the roof of the cave which was covered in a thin layer of green algae. 
The constant crashing of waterfalls brought a sense of comfort, and the sound was oddly pleasing to the ears. This was the Dragon Grotto, a large cavern located at the top of a waterfall beside the Jade Palace. Yigwei often used it as a place to meditate, and now it was used by Shifu. Yes, but not for long. I said, the day after tomorrow, we were going to set out for a battle. And I thought I should meet my father one last time before heading to battle. Although I was confident in my abilities, anything could happen in a war. How did the journey treat you, my son? Shifu asked me as he stayed in his place. I cracked a smile at his question, it was far from the journey I expected. It was short and eventful, but it was also eye-opening. Is it now? Shifu said, I could feel the smile in his voice. I heard you were quite rough with your old acquaintances. Can't say I didn't warn them. Shifu chuckled for a short while before he stood up and turned to me. His eyes looked at me with the love of a father, and his serene smile put me at ease. I am sure you did, he said and walked towards me. He used Hinkun and his kai to walk on top of the water as he came by my side. So, he drawled and gestured with his hands to follow me. I heard you became the supreme general for Lord Shen and his army. I followed him as we walked towards the edge of the cavern, and we stood there to gaze at the beauty of the green valley below. I did. I said and shook my head, although I did not see it coming either. Shen really has a way with words to convince me. Shifu laughs. Yes. I do remember little Shen to be quite the orator, while also being charismatic. His father was always so proud, and we would have a friendly competition on who has the more accomplished son. I smiled at that and recalled the past. The past when things were so much simpler and easier. So, a war that will be the end of all wars, huh? Shifu asked me, tell me, son, how much of that is true? I stayed silent for a few seconds before I opened my mouth to answer, all of it is true and more. Although it was only a part of my plan, my desire to unite China and get it under one rule was very real. The greater good might not be my first priority, but it was definitely one of the reasons why I am doing this. More. Shifu raised an eyebrow. Yes. Like I said before, I have had an eye-opening experience. I said and paused. I think I know where I will be going from now on. I have found my own path. Shifu turned towards me, and the most heartfelt smile appeared on his face. I am proud of you, son. I wish you luck in whatever you are trying to achieve. After all, it is a dream that came from your own heart, and not inspired by the selfish wish of some red panda. I was thrown in for a loop as I got lost in his smile. I felt a tightness in my heart, and there was no longer a doubt or hesitation in my heart. I was afraid of how Shifu would react towards what I was planning and my goal to unify China. But in the end, I was only met with a father who was happy to see his son chase after his ambition. And I am glad that you are putting an end to this whole thing, and give a much needed conclusion for China. I know you have the power and in my opinion, it is a good thing. Shifu said, if it must happen, I am happy knowing you will do it. My lips thinned as I took in his words quote, I'm afraid the reason behind it comes not from a righteous heart nor good intention. Although you can deduce that by now with how I am working with Shen. Shifu chuckled, does it matter? Sometimes, we do the right things for the wrong reasons and the wrong things for the right reasons. And there is nothing wrong with Shen. You know, he was the only one that was banished from Gongmen City. And the wolves and the gorillas follow him by their own free will. Even though they knew Shen would not be able to reward them nor bring them glory, they decided to follow and serve him with their life. That should at least tell you that he is more than just a cruel ruler. Shifu said, I suppose that is one way you look at it. As long as you follow the codes of war, you will have my blessing in your conquest. Shifu said and waited for my reply. The codes of war will be respected, I said with a nod. The codes of war was something made by Ugwe a long time ago, and date back as far as a thousand years. It was a list of codes Ugwe had carefully created after he learned that conflict and wars were a part of nature. Death was what gave meaning to life. The codes of war was signed by the five dynasties, which were the direct forebearers of the Ten Kingdoms. The codes of war were exactly like the name suggests, something which should be respected in war times. This was not new as even in my past life, something similar had always existed in history. Some of the codes include showing mercy when either side surrenders to the victor, planting trees on the battleground one year after it took place, sparing the soldiers that surrender, and not doing things like not involving civilians in the war, not poisoning or messing with food sources of other kingdoms, not forcing your own citizens into war-related matters. The prohibition of more than half of the kingdom to participate in one war etc. It was basically a list of codes that should be respected during wars. They were what brought a sense of order into a chaotic event such as war. And all the kingdoms respected it most of the time, as they did not want those things to happen to them even if it meant not being able to do it to others. 
You know, speaking about the codes of war, I remember there was a time Uwe used to be a war general as well. He had seen firsthand how bloody a war without order could get, and it was what motivated him to create it in the first place. I hummed in acknowledgement and Shifu and I shared each other company for a few hours. Sometimes we talked about the students, we talked about the past, and most of the time, we just enjoyed the peace and the silence. But as the sun got closer to sinking into the horizon, I knew my time with my father was up. I will be going now. I said, of course, we can't let the Supreme General be absent for long, Shifu said. I walked away from the place and right as I was about to use flash steps to fly, I heard Shifu's voice. Stay safe, son. And if you ever need any help, know that I will always be here, Shifu said, and I turned back to look at him with wide eyes. How could I not? The Jade Palace had been a neutral party for as long as it had existed. But what he just said defied the very foundation of the Jade Palace. He was basically telling me that if I ever needed help, no matter who was after me, he will be there to shelter and help me. He was the master of the Jade Palace. He had a heavy responsibility and duty on his shoulders. But a father's love triumphs over that. I let out a genuine hearty laugh and cracked a smile. Love has made you soft, father. Then I shot towards the sky, and by propelling myself every time I was about to fall, I flew towards Gongment City, and covered the distance which would have taken five days to cover in five hours. Third POV. The kingdom of Shu in the west, Shen has finally made a move. An old baboon said in silence followed the throne room. There were many people gathered in the throne room ranging from soldiers, commanders, generals and the king of Shu. There was also a certain monkey king in the room, and he covered his face after hearing the news. And, the king of Shu asked, he was a giant orangutan that was known for his cunning and wisdom. He had a huge belly and would constantly reach out his long arms for food. They are heading west. Or to be more precise, they are heading towards us. The old baboon said and everyone stilled as if a soundless lighting had just struck the throne room. Lord Shen and his army had begun making their move, and the first kingdom they went after was the closest to them, the Kingdom of Shu, located in the western part of China. How big is the army? A deep and rough voice rang out in the silence. It was the general of the Shu kingdom. He was mean-looking mandrill with a nasty colorful face. That struck an odd sense of horror to everyone who saw him. Around a thousand strong. The old baboon said and opened the scroll in his hand once more. It was the information provided by Master Gazelle of the Kung Fu Council. The Kung Fu Council wanted vengeance against Lord Shen, and was willing to work with any kingdom that was to face off against Shen. In their mind, Shen was a coward who murdered their leader using a trick and an evil dictator who must be put down. So when Shen made a move against Shu, they immediately reached out to the kingdom and offered their assistance. The quote, the enemy of the enemy is my friend, perfectly captures their standing. According to the information provided by Master Gazelle of the Kung Fu Council herself, the army consists of around 200 guerrilla soldiers, 500 wolves, and around 300 other soldiers of Gongmen City. He said and paused to read the scroll more carefully. It seems the soldiers of Gongmen are put at the front lines to be used as pawns, while nearly half of Shen's army are still stationed in the city to control the citizens. Master Ox and Master Croc are also stations in the front lines, and the army is directly led by Shen and Tai Lung. Silence descended the throne room, but you could hear a groan from the Monkey King. Are you sure they are coming for us and not the other kingdoms? The king asked in a hopeful tone. Yes. They made it clear that they meant to attack us in their speech, and the direction they are moving directly points towards us. How long till they reach the kingdom? One noble asked. At the time of writing this scroll, the army is still on the boat crossing the Pearl Lake. But the weapons Shen created are heavy, so they should take some time to reach here. It will take them around three days to reach our borders. We got more than enough time to prepare then. General, what do you think should be our next course of action? The king asked. The mandrel took a few seconds to gather his thoughts. We send scouts and spy to check on the situation, and how the army is separated. They are not that many so they may not even separate. We need to put our forces on the north. That is the place they will most likely attack from. The general said, there were not many towers or walls built in the north, so it was the most suitable place for an attack, especially if they were only a 1,000 force strong. The east, west and south were all places where they shared a border with the neighboring kingdom, the Nanzhao kingdom. There were plenty of towers, barracks, camps, walls etc. built there, and the soldiers who were always stationed there, were well trained and plentiful. Meanwhile, the north was peaceful and the soldiers they put there were mostly to fend off bandits, and protect trading routes and nothing else. There were no other kingdoms located there as it was foreign ground, and that made it more vulnerable. So if someone with a small army were to launch an attack, it would most likely be from the north. They would make their way through the cities and capture Thaya capital that way. Okay? 
Then we need to send reinforcement to the north. We will show that Peacock just who he is messing with. Lord Shen's ambition dies here because he chose the wrong kingdom to attack first. The Orangutan King said, For now, they will send their army to the north and wait for more information about the enemy. Fortunately, the enemy was respecting the code of walls, and it makes things easier. They outnumber Shen's army by 1 to 100 even if Tai Lung was to lead them. It wouldn't make up for the differences in sheer numbers. Amongst them, only the Monkey King who was the guardian of the capital city was doubtful. While the leaders of Shu were busy making plans and coming up with a strategy to deal with the real threat, which was the alliance of Shen and Tai Lung, a foreboding storm was brewing all across China. The other kingdoms were spying on the events carefully and became silent observers at the moment. They were waiting for the right time to move where they would be able to reap the most benefits. They did not send reinforcement to the kingdom of Shu, nor made trouble in the borders to take advantage of their preparation. Instead, they gave Lord Shen and the kingdom of Shu the space they needed to battle against each other. The hearts of the people all across China were also struck by fear and anticipation, although wars were common, and hearing the news of different kingdoms waging wars was not that rare. What was happening before them was something new, something more cursed. Tai Lung, the name struck chords of fear in their heart, as his strength and threat rang out like a melody throughout China. Although he was hated, feared and everything in between, people were not strangers to the power this snow leopard holds. Yet he was now armed with even more power. The Supreme General Tai Lung, naturally held more weight than the villain slash criminal Tai Lung. Trade still flourished even in Gongmen City, and the people were still living their normal lives, as the codes of war were respected. But everyone knew that a great change was happening around them in real time. China was silent and still as it witnessed history, the start of a legendary saga. On the west coast of China, a certain snow leopard leapt off the boat and landed on the sand. His senses took in the world around him in meticulous detail. That would overload the mind of the average animal. A thick fog covered the surroundings. But as if having the ability to see through the clouds, a smile crept up to his face as he looked towards the kingdom of Shu. And so it begins. He said, he was wearing a gauntlet and a shoulder guard made from iron to show his status as the general, but he left the rest of his torso bare to the world, as if saying he did not need the protection of any armor. A seemingly reckless attire for a general who was about to fight a war. But if you knew the extent of his power, you would understand why he did not need such heavy and restricting armor. And then behind him, many boats arrived at the beach, and the guerrilla soldiers leaped out of the boat to anchor them, and to unload the cannons contained. Get ready anchor the boats and unload the weapons. Don't keep the general waiting boss wolf quickly yelled out his orders before he howled into the sky. All of the wolves in the pack quickly joined the howl, and the fog slowly disappeared to reveal hundreds of soldiers landing on the beach preparing for war. Third POV, the spirit realm. Hum. Yigui hummed as he floated near a peach tree. His body was positioned in a meditative position, and his eyes were closed in concentration. After a long time of meditation, the old tortoise who never found peace and rest even after death opened his eyes. This is truly bad, he said with a sagely nod, but a carefree chuckle followed. Even though he was just a spirit in the spirit realm, he could still see the events happening in the mortal realm, and he still had his foresight. Even if no one was aware of it, he was guiding the world from the spirit realms. He did this mostly by sending messages to the people in the mortal realm. Yigui let out a sigh and shook his head. For a master who preached the teaching of inner peace and was considered the wisest of all, he sure did have many regrets after his death. Most of which he only came to realize now after his death. There were many things he wished he had done differently. But that's okay. Yigui smiled. For so long he considered himself to be wise and thought he had learned everything there was to learn. But the universe had a strange way of enlightening someone. He was not perfect, he was not without flaws. But that gave Ugwe a chance to have faith again. Ugwe tilted his head slightly as a green blade whizzed past him. He finally opened his eyes and saw his old friend Kai, who had returned once more to battle him. Ah, Kai, I was tired of waiting for you, Ugwe said, and a wrinkly smile appeared on his aged face. Oh, did you miss me already while I was away? Kai chuckled and pulled back his chain blade with a flick of his wrist. I found something interesting while I was away. Kai said and showed off a jade amulet which was shaped like a rhino. He was an interesting kid. Had a powerful Kai too. Kai said with a smile and flexed his muscles which bulged out with raw strength once held by Master Rhino. Ah, Master Thundering Rhino. Yigui said, recognizing the Kai before he shook his head with pity. Such a tragedy to see him here so young. The young child had much to learn. Yeah. Yeah, anyways Kai drawled as he scratched his chin with his blade. Have you ever heard of a warrior named Tai Lung? Yigui froze for a brief instance. I may or may not have heard of him yes. He said with a wry smile. I fought with the rhino kid to steal his children, and before I finally turned him into a jade pendant. 
I told him to be glad that he was going to be extinguished by my hands, the strongest warrior he has ever fought. And, and, the kid said I was not the strongest warrior he had fought. He said that title belongs to someone named Tai Lung. A peal of laughter rolled off Ugwe's throat. I can see that, yes. Are you mocking me? How can I mock you, my old friend? You are like a brother to me. Igwe said while wiping a tear off his eye. Kai huffed and released steam from his nose. Then he started spinning his weapon, getting ready to fight again. Get ready for round whatever it is. Kai said, and an excited smile soon split his face. Igwe smiled for one last time. Before his eyes started glowing golden, and the hero Kai surrounded him. Kai was taken aback as it was the first time he had seen Ugwe get serious in their confrontation. I'm sorry Kai, but I will have to hold you back here for a little bit longer. He said, the world is still not ready for your revival. Bastard Kai yelled and exploded out to clash with his old friend. A great explosion erupted in the spirit realm, disintegrating everything in the vicinity as two powerhouses met in an epic clash. This was one way Ugwe could repent for his mistake. Kai was not as strong as Cannon, since he did not get Tai Lung's Kai, so he would be able to hold him off for a little longer. But all he can do was buy more time for the world. Kai's return was inevitable. Third POV after the army of Gongmen City crossed Pearl Lake, they immediately headed further down west. Their movements were greatly slowed down by the heavy cannons they carried like the enemy had predicted, and they took three whole days to reach the border of Shu. It was at this point that they started executing their war strategy which was quite simple. They will send their strongest force to the north of the kingdom, and launch an attack from there. The rest of the army would then attack from the east, which was the furthest from the neighboring kingdom, to make sure that no reinforcements could come from the other kingdoms. In this battle, Lord Shen planned to use the element of surprise, and march his way straight through the defenses, Shu would erect to stop them. Although people knew that he had a weapon that could even kill the likes of Master Rhino, they were not aware of the full extent of its abilities. They probably thought it was a weapon that target one person at a time, and not something that works better against a huge army than a single individual. There were also the new explosives that he had devised with the help of Tai Lung, so he was at least confident in taking any elite army Shu would put forward to stop them. It will be an absolute devastation. The plan is simple. We will send our strongest force to the north, and the rest will move towards the east and attack from there. Lord Shen addressed his soldiers and amongst them, Master Ox and Master Croc shed a look. When night came and while everyone else was asleep, Master Ox sneaked away from the camp. Master Ox and Master Croc were forced to fight in this war by Tai Lun, as he threatened them to not only kill them, but the citizens of Gongmen City would suffer if they disobey his orders. With all his bad reputation, the masters did not doubt his words, and called his bluff. So for now, as the sworn protector of the Gonjman city and its citizens, they will fight in the war against you. They have been invaluable asset to the army, as they were not only great instructors for the soldiers. Their fighting power was one of the best as you would expect from the higher ranks of the Kung Fu Council. But they were not planning to be helpless victims in this war. They were more than just lost lamps Tai Lung could force and control to his whims. Here, take it. Master Ox said in a hushed voice, and gave a scroll to a messenger bird who was hiding in the bushes. The scroll contained the plans and strategy Tai Lung and Lord Shen had devised. Thank you Master Ox. The messenger said his hitful thanks to the one-horned ox before he flew away in the night. He was an owl so there was no sound as he flapped his wings and took off into the night. Master Ox watched as the messenger flew away, and he slowly sneaked back into the camp. But through the whole ordeal, he did not notice the pair of yellow eyes, which glow eerily in the dark. They were always on him. A few days later, the eastern defense line of Shu, after getting information from Master Gazelle, and making sure that the war strategy of Lord Shen and Tai Lung was just as expected, the Shu dispatched most of its soldiers to the north to stop the attack. But the east was not disregarded either as 5,000 soldiers which consisted of mostly primates, were stationed in the eastern walls. Three days quickly passed, and then four, finally Lord Shen and his army had reached the eastern defensive lines. But something was wrong. There was a taste of something else in the air, and as the soldiers of Shu looked at the horizon where the army of Shen was slowly appearing, they knew they had made a huge blunder. All the army are here. Damn it. We have been tricked. The Monkey King who had been ordered to lead the defensive line in the east cursed out loud when he saw the thousand strong soldiers coming towards them. They have been thoroughly tricked. But how could that happen? The information they got was from Master Ox himself, and it should definitely be trustworthy. 
because even Lord Shen had repeated the plan many times to his soldiers. So how? Not the time. Monkey King bit on his own tongue as he looked around at the soldiers he was leading. They were 5,000 strong and definitely had the advantage against the enemy when it came to number. But he knew that would not be able to make up for the difference in the quality of their power. The army had Tai Lung and the weapons that Lord Shen had created. Soldiers. Prepare for battle we have to protect our home from the evil claws of Tai Lung and Lord Shen. Monkey King yelled out as his soldiers gathered their courage to face the full force of the Gongmen army. They could see them on the horizon, and they were marching ever closer. They were only a thousand strong, yet the presence they had made them seem ten times that amount. Messenger. Monkey King called out, and a small crow flew towards him. Fly back to the capital and report the situation immediately. We have been tricked by Lord Shen. There will be no attack in the north as all of the army had gathered here. Ask for reinforcement as quickly as possible. The Monkey King said the crow immediately took off to report the news to the enemy. The Monkey King clicked his tongue when he saw the slow flight speed of the crow. They sent a lot of birds to scout the enemy army, and most of them never returned, as they were probably killed by the enemy birds. Or even Tai Lung himself, who knew the crane technique. So the current messenger they had was just a civilian they recruited to make up for all of the lost birds, as some who refused to continue working for them in fear of death. Ready the catapult. Archers get into position Monkey King yelled, and his voice infused with Kai was able to reach even the ears of the enemy. They have towers and a huge wall that is 20 miles long and protects the King of Shu from the east. They have the advantage of numbers and home ground, so he hoped they could hold the force long enough for reinforcement to come. The soldiers moved into position as quickly as they could, and they started loading up the catapult which they would launch the moment the enemy crossed the range. Monkey King used a telescope and looked at the enemy. He could see them stopping way before they entered into the range of the catapult and archers. Then they started loading up the weapons which were called cannons. He cursed under his breath and quickly counted how many of the weapons there were. While he was doing so, his eyes searched for the person he dreaded the most. But oddly enough, he could not find him. That gave him a bad feeling. But he did saw Lord Shen, who was standing at the forefront of the army. The Monkey King focused on Shen, who had the most carefree and disgoing smile he had ever seen on a king in the middle of war. It was the smile of a victor. And then, Lord Wen waved his wings and his beak smoothed to speak one order. Monkey King could read what came out of Shen's beak. Fire. Oh, god damn it. Monkey King cursed and put away his telescope to stare at the horizon, which was suddenly lit up in the color of red. Then he saw streaks of red line flying towards the wall and to his soldiers. They were like fireworks, but he knew they were something much worse. If fireworks were the manifestation of dreams and wonder, this one was a nightmare, a hell on earth. Boom boom. The sound reached them, and they were a melodious beat of their death, a song to their funeral. It would likely be impossible to hold the fort until reinforcement arrives. It would be a miracle if they held out for half a day. But fortunately, Monkey King could maybe provide that miracle they needed. Brace yourselves, Monkey King yelled as the soldiers ran around like headless chickens. They have been through countless wars, and they trained all of their life learning the way of violence. But this was like nothing they had ever seen before. This was an advanced form of war which none of them were familiar with. It was the ultimate violence of the future. They knew how to fight against soldiers and warriors. But what they faced was the cold touch of metal, and the indifferent heat of a raging fire. The cannons reached them and they crashed against the stone wall of their defense. An explosion followed as the towers and fort shook violently. The Monkey King, the Sage of the West, let out his Kai, and his body was soon covered with the heroic color of gold. He leapt off and bravely faced the cannonballs, but the rest of the soldiers were meat in a pot waiting to be butchered. Limbs flew off, and the shockwave sent the soldiers to their death as they met their end, without even being able to fight back. The weapons Shen had created were truly cruel, as the soldiers did not get the glorious death they always dreamed of. Instead, they met their end like any civilian. Absolutely helpless. War was violent. The Monkey King knew this as someone who gained fame through wars. But what he witnessed that day was beyond anything he had ever seen before. Rushed towards the enemy Monkey King yelled as he punched and kicked away multiple cannonballs. But they were just too many in number. It was just a waste of his Kai. They could not fight back from this range. So if they wanted to even stand a chance against them, they needed to close the gap between themselves. The soldiers got out of the towers and leapt off the walls before they started running towards the enemy. My soldiers pushed forward Monkey King yelled and ran first with his body covered in golden glory. In return, Lord Shen ordered his men to aim a little lower as they started massacring the incoming enemy. Monkey King watched as they became the attacker when they were supposed to be the defender. He also watched as his men quickly dwindled in number with every meter of distance they covered. It was then that he realized how easily Shen turned the war in his favor. 
The advantages they had being the defender in their fort and their number slowly died as Lord Shen flipped the table. Ha 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 a desperate laugh rolled off the Monkey King, as he witnessed how easily Shen took away their advantages, and made them his own. They were basically puppet under his control. He had every right to smile like a victor before the war even started. Monkey King realized, he watched as his soldiers died due to the explosions of the weapons. But he thought at least he would avenge them by killing Lord Shen when he reached them. He may be helpless when it was long range. But when he reached them that dream also quickly died down. When he remembered Tai Lung was somewhere there, and two of his friends, Master Ox and Croc, stood beside Lord Shen to protect him. A sage, a prodigy, a war hero. How can he be so helpless? At least, Shen will only win this battle. He can never win the war. When the soldiers in the north reach the east to give a reinforcement, they will put an end to Lord Shen and Tai Lung's ambition. After all, the fact that they would be sending their strongest force to the east was just a lie to trick them. And the soldiers there will quickly realize it, and come back to help in the eastern fronts. The north of Shu, what is the meaning of this? The general of the Shu military asked as he looked through his telescope. On the north of Shu, 50,000 soldiers were stationed here to protect against the invasion of Gong Men. From the information they got, the strongest force was going to invade from the north, so they stationed 10 times the amount they put in the east. Yet even when it was about time the army reached the northern defense line, there was no army in sight. Instead, there was one person walking slowly towards them. He was wearing a black cloak that hid all of his body, so they were not sure who it was. The person in the hood took out his hands from the cloak and started badging his hands. He wrapped the white bandage tightly around each of his fingers in such a way that his claws remained out and not retracted. I thought they were sending their strongest force here to the north. The general muttered in confusion. They did. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much. And it keeps me going. Plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.